How's everybody doing today? Everybody good? Yes? yes. Okay. Uh, well, um, first I want to thank uh, the town board for coming early. I, I know this is not a part of our normal meeting schedule, so I appreciate everybody taking the time uh, from work and your other busy schedules to be here. Uh, we're here tonight to present the 2020 capital improvement plan. Uh, so this is our, our first meeting on the subject. Um, so uh, we have worked to uh, present capital projects that align to our strategic plan. Uh, we have worked hard to um, address budget requests to our revenue forecast. And then uh, I believe we're presenting tonight needs that are either um, essential or um, immediate as far as uh, how staff kind of warrants those. Um, I want to thank staff uh, for all your work going into this. I know that countless hours have gone into this preparation. Uh, and then I wanted to say that tonight's purpose is really to, to have a nice conversation. I think from staff side, I think we present, here's a project, here's our estimated cost. Uh, this is, is really the first opportunity for the town board to see and hear a lot of these. So I hope we have a lot of questions. Um, this is not about staff just saying, hey, board, approve these. I think these are really for us to present to you. Uh, let us know how we think we're addressing the needs of the community. For you to ask whatever questions you have. And uh, this meeting will go as long as it needs to go um, so, so we can have all those questions answered. So uh, with that, I'd like to uh, have Mr. Moyer uh, kind of start out with uh, the town's revenue projections and give you a brief overview on the plan. Thank you. We got the screen. Okay, so on our, our capital improvement plan, the bullets on the right are the sources of funds that we are able to use to fund these various projects. You can see that we use a big chunk of sales tax. And the other thing I wanted, well, two things I wanted to point out was you can see the traffic impact fee and severance tax and utility impact fees are a big part of this plan. What I also, that's growth driven and we all are aware of the number of building permits that we were doing this year. The other thing that I wanted to point out was something that is not here. That is our property tax. We do not, we do not use any of the property tax for our capital stuff. We use that strictly for uh, um, operations. So a couple of things, then we'll move off of this one. A lot of these things are very, uh, very restrictive on what they can be used for. Like the lottery funds, that's conservation trust. That's very specific on what it can be used for. Parks and open space. So we can't be using it. And by the same token, we can't be using utility impact fees for open space projects. So that's strictly uh, paid at a time of building permit. It's to expand our uh, service area. <coughs> So here's all that pie, um, the, the revenue numbers represented not in the form of that pie. Uh, Mr. I sent this out to you this morning. Mr. Sislowski asked if I could put this together. Um, these are all the sources of tax and, and fees that we put towards our plan. And you can see that over here in 2014, there was no 0.75 construction use tax or sales tax. That was approved. That was the ballot measure that we approved for the expansion of the CRC. So pretty self-explanatory here. You can see that, you know, as we move across the bottom here, 2018, we had roughly $30 million. And back in 2014, we had 13 and a half. So in a matter of a few short years, we've more than doubled the tax money available to us. Go ahead. So when we were putting this plan together, we, did, we had some assumptions as to uh, how we were gonna get to those revenue numbers. So Carl and I and Shane talked about, you know, where did we wanna put the numbers? So what we came up with at sales tax, and you all know that every, um, every month I do that report, I'm saying this is a new record in sales tax. So 
we went around a little bit about what we should uh, use the sales tax number. And we got to where we agreed on 5% increase over what we thought 2019 would finish. So that's, what we, that's the way we have it now. Uh, construction use tax, this is always a hard one to get, get your hands on because every year we, we try and go conservative, but then it seems every year we blow that permit number out of the water, this year being no exception. So we went with a three-year average of, of permits. Getting back to point one, yeah. the sales tax, the yeah. 5% increase, what, what did we do in 2018 or previous to that? Was it 5% or was uh, it You know, we were doing a three-year average and and it was it was very low you know we and we always have our theory on this was we have a if we do that if we're every year we're collecting more sales tax than we had in the budget we could be using that for more projects so well i would just say when we did that last year mayor the three-year average actually showed our sales tax dropping on a three-year average and i thought it it, it seems like it's just not good information to work with. You know, showing that we're going to take a 10 or 15% drop in actual revenue, it, it just doesn't seem real. So, so that's why we take in sales tax kind of out. I think in actual receipts, I mean, this year we're ahead by what? Uh, through, the, through the end of July, I think it was close to 10 million. I think. What I mean is a percentage over last year, though. Oh, oh, like twelve percent. Yeah, and, and, and so we've been doing double digits every year. Um, you know, and this is a forecast, but the three-year rolling average, because the town has grown so much, we would actually be forecasting a drop in sales tax, just based on a three-year rolling average. I, I think a three-year rolling average, when you look at like your construction use tax and your traffic impact fees, makes more sense because that is a little bit more cyclical. It is a little bit more. Um, up to the whims of the market, and so then it does make more sense to, to use that average number, even if it does show you a lower forecast. Uh, but I don't think that holds water when you look at sales tax. So, so that's why it's different for sales tax. Okay. Uh, this one, traffic impact fees, again, that's development uh, driven by the number of building permits. <clears throat> Gas and oil royalties, that, that kind of fluctuates a lot depending on the price of oil. So we, we, again with that, we did the three year average of the, of the past three years and put it at, at that average. Interest is, you know, interest is what it is. It's, it's money we earn on our, our investments. And the uh, park and trail development fees this is one of those restrictive uh, sources of revenue that we, we have to, when we collect it, we have to, can you all see? We have to uh, use that for uh, park improvement. So that's pretty restricted there. We also did three years there. And the lottery funds, uh, I mentioned those earlier. That's very, it used to be you could use it for a lot more things, but it's really <coughs> restrictive now. So like I said, we have to do parks and open space projects with that. And severance tax, that's a little, that's a little dicey as well. That's uh, the energy impact money that we get from the state. Uh, I think I put it in my last report. We had budgeted for 2019, 300 and some thousand dollars. And we got the notification last week that between the severance and the mineral lease revenue, it was closer to 700,000. So it's kind of a, a, a crapshoot to get the exact correct number. You know, when I say severance tax, it's impossible because it's, it's coming from the state and, and the state um, measures that on how many people are employed in your community. It, it, there, there's just no way to actually yeah. forecast that at all. It, it's every year it's a complete surprise, up or down. Yeah. So just uh, as a uh, history, that severance tax, we used to keep that in our general fund and use it for operations. Mm -hmm. I think the first year that I started here, um, when uh, 
or we get that uh, severance tax, I think that was around $15,000. But then when the oil boom started, of course, it got higher. So this is the stuff we've been talking about and the numbers that we settled on as far as uh, revenue for our plan here. This is the capital improvement fund. This we can use to buy uh, equipment, parks, and uh, work on the roads. This originally was passed in 1997. It was, and now it's one of our bigger, as you can see, it's one of our bigger sources of revenue. <coughs> CRC expansion fund. This uh, was I talked about. We had a, what was it, 2015? We we did that building, and uh, that's a, uh, that's the. Uh, percentage that we did on the uh, ballot and it's a point 75 percent and uh, that's to be used strictly for the uh, CRC expansion go ahead Carl park improvement fund uh, in this fund we have the park and trail development fees that I talked about and also the uh, open space tax, and that's only in Larimer County. Well, it does not have, a, have such a tax, but the stipulation on that is that we have to use it, obviously, like it says, open space in Larimer County. Right. Yeah, and I'm sorry, Miles has a question. Oh, I'm sorry. On that file, we passed a new ordinance to create it. We changed it from just parks to parks and trails. Right. On, the, on so the fee? So are there two funds of this, or is there? I believe fine, and they'll have to answer that. I think they're, they are <clears throat> tracking it separately, but it's in one pot of money, this pot. Correct. So part of this pot is restricted to the parks, and over the last nine months or years. Correct. Open trail. Correct. OK. Anybody else? Uh, I mentioned about this conservation trust fund, the lottery money. Uh, that's a little easier to predict, but again, it's restricted that we have to use it on, on uh, open space and trails. Go ahead, Carl. These are the, the development impact fees. We common, more commonly call them tap fees, but that's for pe uh, paid at time of building permit for people to hook onto our water, <coughs> sewer, and drainage system. So as you can imagine with the, our continued growth, those are pretty strong sources of revenue. And then this is just covering the stuff we've been talking about here. Uh, a lot of numbers here, but you can see as we progress over here, uh, we get the, the pot gets bigger every year. So, I mean, I, at some point I imagine it's gonna slow down, but I guess I've been kind of saying that for 20 years now. But uh, anyway, that's a summary there. And this is just a gra uh, graph of, you can see 2019 budget, 2018 actual, and that blue line is what, where we settled for uh, 2020. Carl. Okay, so. Um, okay, and before we go, I, I just want to ask if the board has any other questions about the revenue. <coughs> Looks like we have pretty more. Well, nothing about the revenue, but the CRC expansion balance. Yeah. Maybe later, a couple weeks, we'll get an update on the balance. We always want to pay that bond off early. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's another thing like Eric was describing. We keep it on a separate Excel spreadsheet, but <coughs> the whole thing goes into the, you know, into yeah, the account. Yeah, curious to see how close we are. Sure. Or not. Go ahead. Well, I was saying why the bond repayment comes out of the 0.2%. Is that correct? Yeah, out of that, out of that, it's a little misleading because the original, uh, the original building was also 0.2%. And then when we got this most recent expansion, we did that point uh, seven five, and 
0.55 of that is to pay off the uh, uh, debt service. And then it, it goes, and no, I might have it backwards. No, that's right. Is that You're right? You're right. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, but, and then once the bonds are paid, that part of that tax goes away. So we, we did that specifically so we could, you know, if we pay off the bonds early, we don't have to charge that much tax. Is that sunset, that 0.75? Now, that, part, will the, that be there for the, the, the point for five five essentially like once the debt is paid off point five, point five, five, yeah. five yeah. and um, Eric and I have had some conversations about the point two and we've got some other thoughts to talk to Ford about with that. To answer Miles' question, so the old tax has three years to be paid off. The new, I believe, is at twelve. <clears throat> And Miles was asking if we give them a financial maybe right. analysis to say, you know, can we pay this thing off in 2024, 25, right. can we yeah. pay it off early? Yeah. I just meant if we if we just stayed on the schedule we're on, the, yeah. that's where we're at. Because I think I thought the board could actually pass some kind of policy where we, I mean, I, there was like a three-year delay between the last tax cut and the Provided we could, yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, get that paid off okay. ASAP. So I want to make sure we're following that. Because we should be down lower than 12 years if we're um, following, if we're making extra payments, which we've had extra money more than the payment. So that should be, which we weren't able to put towards a payment because then we were going to get, there was some kind of restriction or something. Mm -hmm. So I think it's three, I thought it was like three years. Something like that. So we should be in that time period, though, now, where we should be able well, to take that money, money, and we wanted to get that thing, take all that money, and use it to dump in to pay that off. Okay. Okay. David? Uh, Dave, do you have it? Can you go back to the uh, funding source table that you had? Probably about four, <coughs> four or five slides back. Down there in the corner. This one? <laughs> this one? <laughs> so when somebody is making a comment. Some more. Okay. Yes, thank you. And only because like, as we were talking, it's, I kind of put a dot by those items that I felt was, were related or dependent on new construction. And it seems obviously new construction may be residential of some type for commercial industrial. I'm going to guess that on the um, construction use tax number, for instance, 3.4 million, the amount of that attributable to commercial industrial new construction is minuscule compared to residential? I, I'm going to venture that that is correct, yeah. yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't know the split right in my head, um, but that is, that number is largely driven by residential. So the, I'm, I'm the park improvement fees, traffic impact, water PIF, sewer PIF, drainage, those are all really related to new construction. Yes. Right? Yes. I, I, if we look at this five year, and thank you for doing this. Yeah. I mean, obviously, if we had to go like 2014, our, our lives would change quite a bit in terms mm -hmm. of available funds for yes. improvement. Yes. But to say that construction over the last three years is a forecast of what construction will be next year or the year after it seems we all know or we hope i guess at some point we run out of land and there won't be new construction certainly not at the pace that it's been developed um, we also had a study where we all looked at where does the town end up in terms of population we looked at the existing approved already approved uh, PUDs and, mm -hmm. and other neighborhoods. So I, I suspect if we wanted to say, forget last year, let's look at what we think is going to happen next year, we may be able to arrive at a fairly reasonable number in terms of new homes. And yeah, we did that 
we did what you were talking about, you know, how many lots we had available, worked with Scott and the planning department about what they thought was going to happen, and, you know, got it as, as close as we could. Right. So, um, and, and also, David, and you had this kind of similar question last year. You know, we, we meet as, um, with the capital group every month. And, and so, you know, finance is always in the meeting. We're always getting updates on the projects. But it also, I always look at, you know, it's the board's absolute prerogative to budget for projects and say, let's do X, Y, and Z. It's my prerogative to at least put a hold on and say, hold on a second. You know, we haven't seen any new homes yet. We've slowed down. Let's go back and talk to the board about these and whether or not it's wise to do these given the slowdown. So we try to really align what's happening with what's planned. And so we, have, we really haven't had to do that yet, but that's a monthly meeting we have. Finance is always in the room. Um, most of the time, we're just kind of getting updates from for Carl's pace of things, but we always have the ability to slow down if we need to internally. So, if I want to get that out, no. So, so for, I mean, that's, that was going to be my question. What protection <coughs> do we have built in here? Because I know, like, Loveland in their budget, a lot in some of our fellow communities, they're already looking and predicting a 2021 recession, mm -hmm. and they are preparing their budgets to reflect that accordingly, is mm -hmm. my understanding. So I want to make sure that, I mean, well, we're having good years right now, but right. I think we need to make sure that we don't get ourselves over budgeted right and then all of a sudden we're faced with we don't have these numbers as we're predicting or seeing them today well i guess i would i would echo what shane said that one side of it we look at the projects themselves and then my side of it is i look i check on our revenue you know when i tell you all it at the meetings and whatnot so between those two you know we'll keep an eye on it so we don't get caught off guard. Well, and we, and we have two different um, fronts. So the, the board was presented with the capital project and kind of what the new fund balances are going to be. We also have the operational budget, which is, um, I think, from the general fund, like we left about 1.5 million cushion. So it, again, not knowing what next year is going to be, there's a big cushion on the operational side. We kind of built that in, not understanding what's going to happen next year, Mayor. So um, I think we left ourselves a big cushion there, and it's really kind of the forward project on this to say, do we do this project next year, given that? You know, and, and I, I try not to edit the capital near as much as operational, because I feel like the board needs to see all these capital requests and really you guys use your product to say yes, no. Um, but but the, we kind of, because uh, I don't know if it's going to happen in 2021, but it feels like something's going to happen, right? It's going to slow down. So we try to build in a good buffer on operation. Shane, I guess on that, and you're right, I'll probably ask this next year too. <laughs> yeah. But um, because the planning is, I get so nervous about crystal ball right? yep. and, and getting ourselves in a financial pinch when we just simply didn't forecast well. Um, so I found myself looking at this, and I don't maybe this is coming up Dean later, but I was kind of seeing this fund by fund, to like today's balance, estimated 2020 revenues, and then the ending balance, assuming we did all of the projects as reflected here. Yes. I, I know we saw that, I'm pretty sure we saw that last year later in the process. Mm -hmm. it, I'm guessing. I, it, I think it might be in here, it's, yeah, but, but this that. doesn't have any operations. This is just the product uh, projects. And when we get in the uh, um, October <coughs> uh, work sessions, we'll talk yeah. more about the, yeah about the operations. We, we broke this up because this is a big, big project. And uh, to try and do all of this and the O&M at one, a couple meetings, it, it was too cumbersome. So yeah, uh, you're right. I'm sorry we don't have page numbers on the slides, but we do have David on, um, Near the end, do you have a capital summary? Yeah, I did. With, I found it. Okay. It's on his page, 126. This is from the packet. The packet now. The previous but packet? The packet that they emailed. This oh, is a oh, printout yeah. of that, and that's numbered just by oh, your, your printer. Your printer. Your printer. Your, your printer. Not the packet's oh, numbered. 126 on the packet. It's printout. about five pages from the back. The capital summary. Okay. Is that what you needed? Yeah. Okay. 
uh, where were we, Carl? So be before we, I hand it off, did, were there any more questions for me? What we're gonna do now is each, you know, all the people who are here have helped us work on this, so various departments are gonna address the various projects that they have in here. And uh, Omar, are you are you doing the engineering or? Huh? Doug? Oh. And I'd say for all of our staff, especially ones that, that don't present in front of the board a lot, if you could please just introduce yourself really quick so everybody knows. My name is Doug Roth. I'm a civil engineer in the engineering department. Good job, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sean. Yeah, we've been, I've been looking forward to this all day. So. <laughs> So we have a series of uh, road oversizing projects that are predominantly associated with uh, new uh, land development projects. So the first one on the list is Harmony Road between County Road 13 and 15. And if anyone's been down Harmony Road recently, you'll see that uh, the road has been widened kind of from the half mile point kind of smack dab between 15 and 13 to west towards uh, all the way to County Road 13. So that's in this year's budget for oversizing. The project on the board here is for <coughs> next year, for 2020, to continue the oversizing all the way to County Road 15. And part of that is uh, we're having the developer widen on the south side of the road too, rather than just the north side on their side. Um, so yeah, so Jeff Mark is required to do it for the Ridge and Harmony side. Um, we're asking him to widen the entire road, and then we reimburse on the south side, but that's out of goal for the time to get reimbursed as that develops. And then we also pay 100% of the median, so that's not really a capacity issue, that's just part of our agreement with uh, in and Severn. So um, we have two budget requests on Harmony for that. Um, and, and the reason why we split it up, we did have some infrastructure issues. We have some uh, street lights that are in the way. I think right. we had some fiber, some other things underneath. It, yeah, there were several utility relocates that had to be completed, fiber lines, electric we, lines. And we've also had some private property owners we've been working with. Um, <coughs> you know, reading between the lines, writing some checks to, to acquire enough right away to get through. And last week, we just secured the last piece of right of way, so everything is clear on the south side of the road now. What portion though are we going to be willing to get reimbursed from? Uh, yeah, the south side. South side between well, what's between existing, 13 what and we 15. just finished. And That's right. Between 13 and 15, and then you know, long term, the town has a plan to continue on to, to uh, 257. It's just I, I don't imagine unless we have a similar kind of development that triggers that that it's gonna be in any kind of short term plan for the town to do that work given our other transportation needs. Yeah, so this project, I'd be 100% sure it's gonna happen. Um, they, they were hoping to get it done this year, but between the right of way acquisition and the power line undergrounding, they just couldn't get it done. So the next project Laramie County Road uh, 5 at Ptarmigan 4th Filing. This would be the section uh, over on kind of the fairgrounds, County Road 5 alignment along the side of the existing uh, golf course Ptarmigan development because there's a proposed <coughs> subdivision on the west side of the road and that would extend between uh, Oakmont, which is the entrance into the existing subdivision down north to uh, Laramie County Road 32E is this section. Yes. Um, so will that be reimbursed by the developer? It will not. So, so the, the challenge we have with Tom Moose development is because the east side of was developed in the county, well the whole development happened in the county, the east side Tarmigan Golf Course in that neighborhood is already established, so some of this widening work is just on the town side. So, so this project would be eligible uh, for the Larimer County open space. I'm not sorry, open space for their uh, 
their uh, transportation tax they floated. Um, that whole section of five, I think from Kimdeth all the way to Johnstown is part of their corridor widening plan. But because this is going sooner, I don't think it's gonna be eligible. So if, if Tom Muth waits a couple years and that tax passes, we actually could get reimbursed from that uh, tax later. Um, right now, it looks like this section is gonna be, Tom is paying for his section on the west side of five. The town is basically paying for the lane on the east side. Okay. <clears throat> that seems like a huge number. First, I mean, what is that, a quarter it, of a mile? And it is for both sides mm -hmm. of the road. It's uh, more than a quarter mile. I believe it's, it's over a half even, I believe. To Oakmont? Yeah, from Oakmont. And this is Oakmont to the north, to 32E. Oakmont to the south is a little shorter. Because it's $4 million between those two it, bullets. Yeah. And we, we also have a roundabout that we're reimbursing a part of. Um, and and the, the property acquisition on five generally is oh, extremely yeah. cumbersome. It's, it's yeah. very expensive. And this number doesn't have property acquisition in it for this section of five. It's just all the widening. Because normally the developer is going to pay for widening on their side of the road, whereas we're widening on the existing Ptarmigan side of the road. Mm -hmm. So that winds up just a town expense. Yes. Sorry, I'm, I'm sort of trying to reconcile from the slide you have to the book we were given. And I, I think I'm finding most of it, at least I found the uh, Ptarmigan 5 to Ptarmigan 4. Finding. Oh, I see. Yeah, we have three different uh, County Road 5 projects yeah. where they okay. each have uh, a few different nuances. Who do we use for the engineering on both these last two projects? Right. TST Engineering is working on this. Uh, they they were Tom Muth's engineer, so they're doing the road design. Doing one on, I, mean, I just noticed the number that is plugged in there is the same for for all those projects, and even for the 2018, it's just a hundred grand. Is that just kind of a kind of an estimate? Because we they are eligible for engineering reimbursement right. as part of the reimbursable cost. So it's reimbursement. So with Tom Muth, because his engineer is TST, that's we're just reimbursing our portion of that cost. And same things we ever Jeff Mark is using on Harmony. Right. So they're they're not really town engineers, they're just eligible reimbursables. And we normally just pick a percentage, what do we pick like five percent? Yeah, five, ten percent of the total project cost. And kind of our share of that, you know. So on Harmony, for example, it's I think about fifty two percent Windsor cost, forty eight percent developer cost. That's kind of what the split worked out on that one. Is Each that project you put is, the medians in. Yeah. Right. Is this work is this work a long term again going to be done and coinciding with the three ninety two and County Road five? The, 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 we're not tying those together. We're not marrying those. They happen to be happening <coughs> at the same time, um, but they're not. They really are <coughs> totally separate. Well, oh, I know, I know. I'm just, just asking if, for ease of the community, if they're being done, we're going to try to be coordinated with each other. With that intersection and then north along five. Yeah, there'll be two separate projects for sure. Yeah, um, I think it's good. Yeah, I mean, well, we have to understand they're both happening, so I think we can try it. But honestly, if, if Tom Luke gets going on on his project on five, that's not going to really. He's not going to wait for us to get ready for three ninety two. So, right. Um, anything else on? That section of County Road Five, and, and so some of some of Five as you move to the south from Oakmont, uh, part of that will be reimbursable as I think to the Jaeger property. It, yeah, yeah, correct. So, so it, is that develops that will be eligible for reimbursement, Miles? So, so that's the next section. The LCR Five to SH three ninety two is what we would say is next to the Jaeger property, mm -hmm. which isn't part of active development, but that section of road just needs to be finished as part of the road widening. So when development happens, that will be reversed. That, that's right. right. And then we also have, as we move <coughs> north of this section, north of Tarmac Golf Course, 
that's also eligible. So anything north of um, 32E. Right. Yep. And, and that's not a lot it, of the projects, but that's also eligible for reimbursement. So yeah, there's a little bit down around the roundabout. That yeah. would be. And, and that is two roundabouts. I don't know if everyone knew that. Uh, Oakmont and 32E is what's planned. Uh, next County Road 5 project is at Fossil Creek <coughs> Ranch. And this one is north of 32E. Um, I want to say 34C, is that the next road? It's close to that. It's right across from the Keene um, asphalt plant or construction site is where this one's located and they have it separated into two phases so they're actually their phase one is on the northern end along County Road 5 and this just includes reimbursement for widening on their side of the road because they are not widening on Keene's side so that that's why this one's a little less than uh, some of the previous projects and then their second phase would be the remainder of the street down to the uh, uh, roundabout at 32E. Would be the phase two, and that's like the following year. That's kind of what we're anticipating. So this is a close. Yes. Our well, so Dallas Horton <laughs> is. <coughs> well, so this we're doing this is all, all part of Moose development, aren't we? Uh, this this piece would be part of Dallas Horton's project, because with Muth we would just be going down to the roundabout at yep. 32E and stopping there and then tying back in. Hey, and we can get out of that roundabout. We don't have to widen. I thought we had to widen it. it to yeah, it'll out. it'll have kind of a taper going back in. So, but you're, you're saying this Fossil Creek Ranch, that only is triggered if Mr. Horton develops? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So those are kind of independent from one another. And we're for sure that Mr. Horton's going to be doing this? No, we're, we're, we're not. Um, I think we're just yeah. putting the budget in there as a request. If he moves forward, we have it in the budget. If he doesn't, then it's just money that gets carried oh. forward for the next year. I mean, and, I just have a big question mark because he's been yeah, saying for 10 years right. he's going to be doing something. So I don't right. Know. I'm a little bit leery about designating such a large amount to somebody who I've been doing mm -hmm. for 10 years is going to do something. Maybe this is sure. finally going to be the time, but I think it's ever the trigger. I think that's a valid concern. A couple of differences between the projects. I know that Muth wanted the guarantee for the reimbursement because of doing the opposite side of the road that he technically isn't responsible for. Whereas on Dallas Horton's project, if the town didn't have the money for it, we wouldn't have that obligation because then it would fall under kind of the IOU deal in the town code on the oversizing. I mean, that, that is a good point. I mean, just kind of your point, Mayor, we could, if Mr. Horton does develop next year, we could just put in the agreement that we can reimburse him <coughs> for 2021. There, there's nothing that would tie us to reimbursing him in 2020. Uh, like Doug said, the, the, the tenor of five has been hard because it's basically, it, we're, we're shifting the road. It's a lot more expensive to do. You're not just doing an overlay and adding two lanes. There's, because of the, um, all the property around there, it's a more expensive section. And so Mr. Muth had asked, um, kind of negotiated if he was going to pay uh, for different things. If for part of it to not be reimbursed full, he has to be reimbursed right away, which we thought were, was reasonable given uh, the cost out here. But for Mr. Horton, we could just kind of take that fossil creek, kick it out of the budget. If he does develop next year, we could just put in the development agreement that he'd be eligible for 2021 if the funds were available. Does it make sense to have it in there in case, even if he doesn't, but if that roundabout is, it's two lanes into the roundabout, is it worth Yeah, but like Doug said, yeah, we're gonna still paper it out, so mm -hmm. we would still do that part of the project regardless. Okay, right. And, and I do think it's important to point out that the Tarmigan fourth filing project and the uh, LCR <coughs> 5 to SH392 project, those really do need to kind of go together and be built by the same contractor. So we always envisioned that Muth's contractor would build that. And we have, uh, those numbers are based on actual bids from GLH that went to Tom Muth. 
So we have a pretty good idea what it's going to cost. So you don't think we would realize any additional cost cost savings, or have you already maybe factored that in? If it's going to be the same party constructing right. both pieces. The, the only thing I would see happening there is that the development is move forward, and then we want to move forward on widening Highway 3 right. and 2. There's existing traffic signals on the north half of that intersection that need to get relocated. So currently that cost to relocate those traffic signals are wrapped up into that number. Which one? Well, at point? The third one. Third. Right, Doug? 392 to Oh, relocating traffic signals? Yeah, because that's part of um, part of the, the three okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, kind of sure. five widening. And, and part of the thinking is that Tom Muth will be building Westgate Drive from kind of the current gas station area down around, and that'll be like an ideal bypass for closing down that section of County Road 5, because uh, it'll have to be closed. It's a, just a major reconstruct. It's not just adding on to the edge of the pavement. Does staff feel like Fossil Creek Ranch is going to happen in the next year or two? Is that why we're, because I've been on yeah. the board almost four years, and I've never heard of this development but obviously more tenured board members have I, that's why i'm you know has it been simmering for so long and now all of a sudden we're thinking something's going to happen I, I think a lot of the developments like that are kind of if he can get a contract with a dr horton or someone like that it would be a go if he can't it's just going to set you know so so he has come through a couple times i know he'd been um i've, I've finally met with him he came through kind of all not that long ago so you know, I'm, I'm being taped right now, so I would say even money. But yeah. it's there, there's certainly yeah. a chance of winning. And again, I don't think that there's a big risk if we didn't budget for that. It would just be the the agreement that we sign with him to get coming next year. Right. I'd say we'll reimburse you the following year. And, and because where he is with planning, I think the odds of him coming through and actually having asphalt down next year are, you know, that window shrinking every day. I think this is on the spreadsheet. It shows 1.9 million on that. The old one. Oh, is the difference on the right of way acquisition or, or the medians? That's what it is. Yeah, because we put the medians in the capital rather than out of the street oversizing. Okay. Is there a difference? Thanks. Median is somewhere else. Yeah, because we've treated, we don't get reimbursed at all. Right. For that. That right. It's a total separate yeah. sound cost for those. Yeah, so rather than taking the median prices out of the road oversizing, we've kind of viewed those as sort of a beautification of the street, uh, kind of a separate item. Okay, and then. Uh, Sewer oversizing, we have down there Pooter Heights Third filing and Rain Dance North, and Pooter Heights Third is another project that we keep seeing ever since I started at the town. It's been a topic. However, the one thing that's changed on this one is, uh, like, I think it was just about a week ago I found out that Rain Dance North is planning on building next year which would mean running a sewer interceptor. And it's the same sewer interceptor that Pooter Heights Third was eligible for reimbursement on. So I talked to Martin's engineer and they kind of ran their best guesstimate on what that oversizing would be and that's where we came up with a million dollars. So that one, for as quick as they move, I would say there's a real possibility that will happen. So, so they would do it and we would reimburse them? Yeah, for, for, okay. right. To where we pay the difference between kind of the sewer line size that they would need for their development, upsize to our 27-inch uh, or 30-inch, whatever it is on this interceptor. And that would be the southwest interceptor that will follow the river from Pewter Heights going west over towards <coughs> County Road 13. And Along then, New Liberty? Um, at the bottom of the bluff, but kind of that same alignment only right down by the river. So almost following the trail, basically. Mm -hmm. 
So I think that's all we had on sewer oversizing. Hi, my name is Curtis Templeman. I'm one of the engineers. Um, I oversee all of our pavement management programs, <coughs> our projects. Um, is there one, three, or four of the five up there are, are pay, part of that pavement project, pavement management projects. <coughs> uh, the, the lonely one is the pedestrian crossings. These are our all annual projects that we, we do each year. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, as you can see in 2020, we're going to be overlaying the streets that are in, the, in purple. Um, and then the green lines are our roadway sill streets. That's where we do a slurry or a chip sill, depending on what the cross section is, whether it has curb and gutter or not. And then the blue lines are our um, streets that we'll be doing concrete on. Uh, these are our 2021 overlay streets. Um, the crack seal streets are pretty numerous, so that's why I don't, I don't put them up there. It pretty well fill up that slide. Um, we do target the green line streets first before we do the seal, um, just to get those cracks sealed up before we do the surface seal on it. Um, and then as far as the pedestrian um, crossings go, those are as requested by citizens or um, town, um, town board or um, even town staff, we go, we'll go out and do a pedestrian count uh, and a traffic count and make sure that they, they meet warrants. So. so I think the board is all familiar. So uh, based on the number of uh, requests we had for RFPs a couple of years ago, last year the board uh, put $100,000 under street crossings. Um, I think for this year we're going to spend that, you know, that they do come in and it is driven mostly um, by citizen request to take a look at intersections that these guys go through and apply our form to that to determine if it warrants. And so maybe we've spent 60000 this year or so, but uh, we've got another one that we're going to put on uh, Jacoby Road. And then um, I think we're going to also do one up in Water Valley South. Yeah, right? it's, a, it's, New, it's New Liberty Road and um, Bayfront, which would be the vineyard. A Bayfront circles around on the south. And it'd be the where Vineyard intersects it. So we have a bus stop there and a trail crossing. So so, so right now it seems like 100,000 is about the right number <coughs> based on the number of requests we had. Um, we do have a, another one that's in the Quick Wind Project, which is a, a hawk signal on 7th Street. Um, but for the most part, I think that 100,000 is continuing the budget request right now should um, address our pace. How much are they? Uh, about 20,000 each, 2025, 20, but depending like that, that hot signal on 7 uh, and River Place is like 65,000 yeah. and up to maybe 120 something thousand. So, um, because the distance and because the infrastructure in place, it can really add to the cost. It's not just the equipment, the equipment is pretty constant, but I think the, the um, amount of infrastructure in place, electricity, and other things available. Why does the distance matter? They're just kind of too independent. Well, it, it changes from, um, I think, it upgrades to a hawk signal, which is a lot more expensive. Hawk is the same as the lights? Overhead lights versus yeah, the similar overhead lights. lights. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Shane, in, in this category, just sort of a process question, I guess, because yeah. I'm you know, looking at that front summary. The, the first project he was talking about in terms of asphalt though really stands out as a sizable expense. As I was looking at it and looking at the summary, it said it was an ongoing, an ongoing scheduled project. Mm -hmm. And the, the obviously budget runs out for you know, every year, because every year you're going to do some type of chip seal asphalt overlay. Uh -huh. What struck me is because I had just finished reading the earlier defining terms that said capital assets are non-recurring expenditures. And it feels like this particular thing is more of a O and M expense than it is capital. It's maintaining a capital asset. I recognize that, but it's maintenance by its own yep. <laughs> label. It's preventive maintenance, which is a capitalized item. I'm sorry. It's preventive maintenance. 
of a capitalized okay. item, which in itself is capital, but not a, an actual asset. Okay. So maybe the So I get what you're saying. I mean, <laughs> a lot of these things we're just doing this once, we're doing that once, whereas uh, maintenance and overlays, we're doing that annually. Yeah, it, it is appropriate to capitalize that. Okay. Yeah. So, so. Dr. Jones, did you have a question? Oh, and then Curtis, you didn't uh, talk about the concrete replacement. So, uh, um, con our concrete replacement is broken up in two. Um, one is we do one year we're doing the concrete ahead of our overlay, so we we separate those by by a year. That we're um, about three four years ago, we were getting into situations where we we're overlaying in October November, which we don't have. You know, you typically don't have the temperatures to be doing that. Um, just because of the, the amount of overlays that we were doing. And so we've split it up. And if you go back to my map, like I said, in 2021, we're going to be overlaying the blue streets. So in 2020, the streets that are up there in blue that have concrete now, we have Long's Peak Circle as one of the streets we have overlay for 2021. There's no concrete on there. So we won't be doing any work on there. But uh, the rest of the blue streets will be going in there, um, looking at the condition of the concrete, and then also update upgrading all the um, ac access ramps to make sure that they meet ADA requirements. Um, and then the second part project that we have is part of our miscellaneous concrete. And that, that is, that's driven um, by either, again, by citizens requesting for us to come look at them, um, us just merely going, driving by and seeing concrete that's in disrepair, or even our street guys. Um, um, and we also get some requests from the town board as well. So Oh, they know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, that's kind of that's those are the two concrete projects that we have. So, each year. so, so from a planning standpoint, you look and the first year you're looking at any of the utilities. Yep. So if we're going to replace any water sewer um, or any <clears throat> duty concrete work, that's year one. And so if you see a new sidewalks going in or sidewalks being replaced, you can almost guarantee the next year we're going to come back and, and do the asphalt. Yeah, and we I work with Terry to make sure that if in his five-year waterline plan that we're doing the water we're overlaying that same street um, either that same year or the year after, but um, that way once we're done in that neighborhood we we move away and and give them a break. Okay, More questions? Any other questions for Curtis? <clears throat> Question for you, Shane. Yes, sir. I just had a Google Hawk pedestrian thing. Do we uh, have those anywhere in town? No. 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 <coughs> so you, you'll see them in every other community. I know Fort Collins has quite a few. Uh, we talked about them, in, I think, on Eastman Park um, as part of the Flood River Trail. We've also looked at their um, appropriateness on 7th Street of River Place. So again, just, just based, I think, and the engineers can tell better, but I think at a certain point when you have enough traffic and it's wide enough that the, um, you know, the, the, the RRFB is inadequate and you kind of go to that next level, giving traffic a little bit more of a heads up. Love was putting one in at, on County Road 5. Yeah. There's one on Drake. I thought the, the signal uh, that we, you know, talked about going off of Jacoby Road, I thought that those were like, 2025. They are. Yeah, our RFPs are about 2025. I mean, assuming you have um, uh, electric on site, you don't have any infrastructure issues, 2025 is a good number. Yep. Is that the same price per hawk, then, too? No. 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 Hawks so are like nice. 65, yeah. and if we've got, I think, okay. 125 shown on that one at River Place. Sorry, I misunderstood you. Yeah, so hawk signals the, just less than a traffic light. I mean, same concept, overhead lights. But they can be converted, right? Um, if you design the foundation to accommodate a future light, I assume it could be. But then there's a question of location that comes into play. So, yeah. Yep. We, we've had our um, <coughs> traffic consultants and our traffic master plan folks really having the conversation of what's warranted where. And uh, I, I know we're fighting a losing battle when we have two paid consultants arguing with each other over what the town wants to do. You know, we're. But 
I'm sorry, maybe I'm the only one who thinks that thinks that's funny but it's our engineers working with our engineers. Uh, with our own engineers in the middle of it trying to facilitate. Right. Uh, yeah. Engineers always think we're right, but <laughs> so uh I'd like to focus on three of the main projects uh, that I have for 2020. Um, the first one being, again, I'm sorry, my name is Omar Herrera. I think most of you know me, uh, the <coughs> engineering department. Uh, the first one here is at Crossroads and New Liberty Road. One of the last items that Dennis Wagner completed before he retired was he had a traffic warrant, uh, traffic signal warrant study completed. This particular intersection met two warrants. Uh, the question came up. Um, and we'll get into it. Why not a roundabout? But as you can see, the cost for a traffic signal at this location is almost double what we have normal, normally been seeing. The reason for that is you have six lanes on Crossroads Boulevard, five lanes on New Liberty Road. Um, and I did check in with some consultants that have done similar designs and that's what they came up with. In addition to the new state laws uh, for utility locating, the engineering costs go up too, so practically double. So we take we took that all into account for the traffic light. The roundabout is about four and a half, five times more than a traffic light. So that's the two point seven million dollar number. So we just wanted to present that to you to keep that in the back of your mind um, as we make a decision what what which direction we want to go. Yeah, I'm looking at the summary sheet here, traffic signal crossroads in New Liberty shows in 2020 a cost of 395. Yeah, that that's a, a bad number. That was after looking into it some more and double checking the figures with the a traffic consultant. Yeah, and, and part of this, and I apologize for that, we had uh, the CIP and the PowerPoint, as you can imagine, this PowerPoint is come together over a few weeks. And so really trying to align the numbers and we update one and make sure the other's updated. So I'm, I'm sorry for that, but it's just, you know. Yeah, your summary shows a 695. Okay. 645. 645. It's 695 on the summary. Okay. So it's somewhere between those two. We've got, we've got three numbers for you. You pick the one you like. <laughs> <laughs> well, all that's out the window around about, but. Um, any other questions about that? So, next <coughs> slide. This particular project is looking at performing a study, really looking at the intersection of three, three, Rock County Road 13 and State Highway 392. I know later on we'll get into uh, one of the transportation master plan quick win projects was to look at improving the northbound, southbound, left turn movements. Um, I think that still is valid. However, there are several other little projects in and around this intersection. I think it's worth looking at the ultimate build out of the intersection so that we can wisely incorporate those interim improvements into what we're gonna do so we're not rebuilding in the future. So I'd like to um, look at that in terms of some of the things going on would be to look at uh, multimodal improvements, um, bike lane ped, ped safety, those kinds of things, along with uh, the trail connections that are being planned from Kiger uh, to the intersection eastbound on Highway 392 and then southbound on Kendra 13, so we can accommodate all that. So, and then the 60% design the other idea was to look at 60% design for the widening of 392 between 17th Street and County Road 13 and kind of do more of a, kind of look at this as a phased approach to this whole area um, over a course of three years where we study the intersection, look at what needs to be done to widen the highway between 13 and 17. And identify that would help us identify our right of way needs, any utilities that need to be relocated, um, be able to go and get those <coughs> things done one year right away in utility relocation work, and then the following year you finish it up with um, actual widening of the road. So that's that one. Any questions? 
So that the 2020 is just the one theory. Yes. So is, is uh, CDOT going to pay any portion of this to be done if the study comes back, et cetera? I mean, we're, are we just doing the studying and then proving it to them and then they put it into their, where, where are we at right now? What, what um, does that look like in the long run with CDOT? That's a great question. Uh, at this point, we have not talked to CDOT directly about their participation. We just thought it would be prudent to go ahead and look at the intersection mainly as a whole and get that figured out. And then from there, based on traffic projections, we can go to CDOT and try to figure out how they participate or not. Yeah, I think that'd be a good follow-up conversation to have with CDOT when we have them back and talk about, you know, if, if public safety is a big part of their charter and what they have money up for, and they've already made the determination that the kind of 392, 257 reroutes aren't feasible, then I think it's really up to the board to kind of hold their feet to the fire and say, okay, then how can you improve our current corridors in projects like this or I think a great conversation to have with that. I think that was up to the town manager. Well, <laughs> I'm gonna say you guys did this a heavy. I'm gonna be the good cop. You got, you got cop. seven bad cops and all this. <laughs> when we say 60% engineering though, where does that leave us if we've done 60%? You know, I'm, I'm yeah, I know I'm, we're, I don't want to get into the weeds on this, but I'm, I'm just thinking about in future years, where do we go with CDOT? You know, are we budgeting for this in future years to so, then tell so, them we're willing to match what they can pick in to you know, get it done? You know, that, so 60% design is a pretty common thing for us to design because you can get a bit off the of 60% design. And so that, that's about as far as we normally take it. So it's really just kind of an engineering standard of saying, we can get big docs off this, we know what to take it next, and we can finish up the design uh, kind of tech there. So that, that's why we take it that far. To the bid point, that's why I made yeah. Okay. So yeah. And thanks for mentioning that, because I heard you say the 60% engineering. I assume that was not part of the 150. Correct. Right. The, so, well, <coughs> no, I'm, no, I'm sorry. The 150 is part of the engineering for 60%. Yeah, um, so 60% design. This is just a design. This is no construction. This is just sixty percent design. Yeah, with the engineering to yep. show what, what it, how would be constructed. Right, and then I we did our best to project out what the right of way costs were in uh, construction improvements the following years. But as we go through the six percent, we'll have a better grasp on those numbers. Omar, on the um, on the bridge, I know Larimer County, if their transportation tax passes, I know they listed. The widening of the bridge is one of the potential projects for that Correct. as well. So I think this is good at potentially widening it to 13 because we could be going for the later. Right. It's halfway there. <coughs> right. Yeah, that, that Lumber County tax, and it would be um, one of the earliest projects. I think it'd be year four or five when the town got that project. So we would have enough time to plan ahead. So. We're, we're, our intention is to try to chip away at this corridor. <laughs> Good. Next slide. Right. So here we have the town's uh, potable water model. The last time it was updated was in 2001. And with all the growth, we thought it'd be a good idea to go ahead and bring that up to date. Uh, what that'll allow us to do is help staff make identify any issues we have with the current system and also plan for future developments and help us make informed decisions with water upsizing and those kinds of things. And I know uh, there was probably a few projects in the summary sheets that we didn't talk about. Um, for example, the work we're doing on State Highway 392, Kenny Road 5, the intersection of Highway 257 and Eastman Park Drive, those will carry into 2020 for construction, but I didn't really get into that. Yeah, so. could you, because that, that 5 and 392 is a major project for the town. So can you just give the board an update? Oh, sure, yeah. 
So we are currently uh, working with CDOT to try to figure out ways to incorporate multimodal improvements. Uh, we had our on-call um, traffic engineering consultant look at adding some, what would it take to add some bike lanes from Westgate Drive uh, east to REA Parkway. So we're presenting some ideas to CDOT. Um, in the meantime, we're still working on preliminary plans with that project. Uh, we don't anticipate any right away, uh, additional right away, I should say, for our portion of the widening. Um, and one of the things that's come up with that particular project, I guess this is a good time to note, to, to talk about it, is a potential cost increase from the original estimate. Uh, FHU, as you know, uh, did the study, put some numbers uh, to the whiteboard, and it, after that point, CDOT came to the town and said, what about, well, I'm not sure entirely the order. Dennis was handling this, I should say. If it was a CDOT-driven thing or a town-driven thing, I can't speak to that. But the question came up with, was, can we convert the existing right turn lane, eastbound right turn lane, into a shared through right turn? Mm -hmm. The study showed that, yes, you can. Uh, but that cost that we were all looking at before did not include that uh, improvement. Where the improvement side comes in is CDOT standards require you to have an eight foot shoulder, paved shoulder where you have a through lane. Right now there's a four foot paved shoulder. So we're gonna have to more than likely tear out that existing four foot shoulder and pave a new eight foot shoulder. So the cost may jump up to two and a half million. I believe they're about two million or 2.2 pre right currently. So thought I would point that out. So, so with the timing though, so are we gonna have the design finished this year? Uh, the goal is to complete design this year. Um, you know, with the potential development uh, to the northeast of, or west of here, it'd be best to wait for those intersection improvements to happen and kind of piggyback like Doug was saying off of their contractor and do our widening improvements. So. Is CDOT gonna pay for any of the improvements? Or? They're not. Well, not we, we, no. we, we, had county? The, <laughs> we, we had, they're not. Uh, so we had the conversation with CDOT. Um, they were willing to contribute a small amount. And I mean like, uh, 150,000 or so, which we would have still taken, but then that would have kicked us into kind of the CDOT standards as far as the plan review and all those things. And honestly, it seemed like it was gonna cost the town significantly more money to take that 150,000. And it was gonna also add a lot of time onto the project. And so uh, when Dennis and I met with Long and kind of understood the cost of the money, we made the decision it's not worth it. You know, it costs us more money to take it. Um, so. When, once you're in the CDOT process, uh, everything from Davis Bacon to the, the plan sheets, it just changes the project and, and not to the betterment of the town. How long does a project like this take? Construction wise. In construction wise, um, for this particular widening, it, it shouldn't take, I'd venture to say, four months or less. I mean, it's all the, even though it's not federalized, there's still a lot of things to go through on the design side, so. So what we're talking, what you're talking about right now, though, is in, in, in the index. It's in our card. No, it's, so we're, yeah, we're that's right. So it's. This is study, but all well, this other stuff. Well, no, the, the construction under uh, the 2020 um, budget is in there. We've got uh, $2 million budgeted uh, for next year for the construction in 2020. We put it in last year, though. We, it's in this year. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah this year. Yeah, it's, it, it was budgeted for this year. I think we told the board at the time, probably not going to be constructed uh, next year, but we'll put it in there. And so, again, I think what you're hearing clearly is it's not, we're not even going to get started on the construction this year. The goal is to finish the design and carry it into next year. So it, it is in next year's budget. Correct. Uh, you mentioned the 257 Eastman Park Drive improvement. Yes. And we've got the CDOT grant, a million dollars or so. Mm -hmm. how, how far are we into that? Has that been designed? So we submitted 60% plans. The CDOT got their feedback 
uh, comments on that, and we're consultants currently addressing those comments. Uh, we we hope to have that design wrapped up by the end of the year as well. Um, so, I think my my goal would be to have that completed by fall of next year. There's a long lead time on traffic signal poles, so it, it's up to could take up to five months to get traffic lights, the, the equipment, so. So if those improvements are best to be able to get their blades around the corner, they're still gonna be. <laughs> still gonna be <laughs> well, I know when uh, the consultant that um, helped the, the town with the uh, application for the funding looked at that, they actually ran some design turning templates. Um, our current design has not been vetted to make sure that can happen, so I can't promise that. Um, but the idea was, if we expanded it, they could certainly do that. Okay, but if that isn't covered, what what else does that expansion or improvement? What's it going to allow now? The, Out there now. Right. the The biggest thing would be to help with the westbound um, left turn movements for large large trucks um, if, if you know CDOT's gone out there and and they've shoved the northbound stop bar south to try to accommodate that but even then yet trucks can struggle to make that left turn so that's the main reason the project was uh, moved forward and it wasn't necessarily to accommodate the blades even though the original study said there is a possibility it would. Either way, uh, they're gonna still use flaggers and probably shut down the intersection to, to go through. Um, I would see that happening, so. So I heard some conversation from the board, so, and I'm sorry for the confusion, there's a couple big carryover projects that, that we discussed last year that are just getting carried forward. So, sorry that there's no slide there, it's just that they were vetted last year and they're just carry over into this next year so we didn't produce a new slide, but they are budgeted. So it's the, the 392 Kenner of five improvements that were done so they're just carried over. And same thing with this Eastman Park um, improvements as well. So sorry for the confusion, it's just we figured the board knows about these projects that are in there, they didn't get done and they're just continuing on. So I'm sorry for the confusion. Yes, sorry. Um, I did, so that's what I was kind of hearing and understanding, but you know, there's a summary sheet in, in our materials that shows 2020 uh, expense of two million fifteen thousand. Uh -huh. uh, that doesn't appear in the summary of the engineering projects, which I understand it's. Well, it, it does, though. I mean, I've, I've no, got it, it, that sheet is here. <coughs> it's not in the summary table on page seven oh. of engineering projects. Correct. <coughs> so there's. And I'm that's what we were all going around that, saying. There's a disconnect for that. Even though budgeted and those funds are there today, earmarked for this project, they're just going to carry over. Mm -hmm. And certainly that means they'll have to be in the CapEx budget for 2020. Mm -hmm. Right. So, yeah. So they, yeah, that's what that's what it is. Couple million. Yeah, like page 82 has all the projects that are carried over. Yeah. Potentially from 19. Yeah, I, I think it's just um, the, yeah, the, the desire to give you guys information in a lot of different places in a lot of different ways. Yeah. That wasn't carried in there, but it is, I mean, it is included in the overall capital budget, right? Like, yeah. uh, I'm sorry for the confusion. You shouldn't have seen it in your, in your package. Uh, that confused matters, but it will be carried over. No, I, I think it's fine that we see it, in fact, because like, we can't budget outside of the current fiscal year. You know, we can't commit to spending money outside of the current fiscal year. Right. So it'll have to be an amount that's again approved. Yeah. Twenty twenty's budget. So yeah. we should see where it rely on it going. Right. So again, on we do have the, the total. What's that? Yeah. Well, on on which document, Carl? Uh, we have page 18. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, I've, I've got that. Sheet. I'm talking about the summary sheet that shows all of them. Third to last. Uh, the third to last. Start with the milling center, Carl. Let's start with the milling center. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah, it's almost that uh, last slide has all the. The, the 2019 projects that are requested to move forward in 2020. What page is it It's like the third slide from the end. Left. On the big Left. slide down. Yeah. 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 Although it says 1.75 in the end for the 392 item. <coughs> hmm. It just would be helpful. I mean, I think for a lot of us, it would be wonderful to have some of these. Things pages more together <laughs> side by side in the future as well. So what we're showing here, 2019 major projects carrying forward to 2020, we only budgeted 1.75 for this year for that project. Yep. And now it looks <coughs> like it's going to be two, two million. million plus. Oh, yeah. So there is an incremental amount. Well and, and again uh, what what Omar was saying is we've got like a, a four foot shoulder of this concrete and we don't know if it was dialed in, right? right. And so if it, if it wasn't dialed in, is he just gonna make us tear that out or replace with an eight foot mm -hmm. concrete shoulder? So it's just something that, and. Yeah, when we asked the question, could we do a four foot shoulder and they wouldn't, wouldn't allow it, so. No, it makes sense. I mean, the way we're getting that extra number makes sense. <coughs> I think that's all I had. I don't know if there's a Slides later on to kind of show us where we are and where. I don't have any slides from this. Yes, sir. Because we just did an update on it. Um, well, I just saw the engineering in here for NISP in mm -hmm. 2020 is $2.4 million. Is that our regular annual payment to NISP? Oh, uh, so NISP? 800 or some thousand of it is our regular payment. And then 1.6 million is uh, the Windsor's portion of the interim financing plan, which is $20 million for the total project. So we're gonna pay all cash for that. Yes. And that'll be for, you know, uh, design work, um, probably some Sorry. water purchases. Those kind yeah, of what was the breakout of that again? <coughs> 800 and, you know what it was called? 840,000 <coughs> or so will be for just our regular NIST mm -hmm. payment you know, for uh, engineering and lawyers and all those things. And then 1.6 million is our cash contribution for the interim financing period, which is financing for the next three to five years related to the, the actual design and construction of the dam and those kind of items. Yeah, yeah that's really based on that last meeting we had with Ms. Mm -hmm. month yep. ago or so. Yep. Okay, thanks, sir. The next project is at what we call the Chestnut to Eastman Park Drive uh, drainage improvements. And it's a project that originated as uh, being identified in the stormwater master plan for the town. And as you're aware, the uh, stormwater fees are collected to pay for the master plan improvements. So uh, this particular project is a carryover project. This year, after we got into the design, wanted to uh, get phase one constructed, but we found out that we were gonna be way over budget to keep moving forward with it. So we put it on, on hold until uh, 2020. 
to do the phase one construction. So phase one construction would be building a uh, drainage pipe. Uh, actually, we could probably go to the next slide. <coughs> yeah, here's some examples of uh, flooding in the area. And it's always hard to get out to the site like when it's at the peak, but after we get there, this is what we saw a couple of different times. So this one, I believe, is uh, Garden Avenue here with uh, Folkestone Park towards the right. This is the care housing just uh, to the uh, south side of Chestnut Street. And then uh, the top right photo would be a picture along Chestnut, kind of following a rain event. And I don't, even, I don't think that that rain event was necessarily anything extraordinary, but, but we know that uh, there's <coughs> parts of that town, you know, that do see quite a bit of uh, drainage impact. So the first phase of the project is to build a storm line along First Street up to uh, Folkestone Park, and then oversize the detention pond at Folkestone as much as we can uh, to get as much detention volume in it. Originally in the master plan, we were looking at running uh, or running in alignment more down uh, Columbine and down this direction, kind of where the existing, there's an existing uh, drain pipe. But after getting into the design, there's just a lot of utilities. The existing line is running through backyards in between homes. It's just kind of a mess. So. So First Street, even though it's longer, it's uh, really a clear shot um, to get through there. And we don't have a lot of easement issues either with that route. And something that we identified with the project, uh, currently the line that runs down through uh, Windsor Village Park and discharges an Eastman Park Drive, the town runs Kern water down to Water Valley through that pipe. And, and we think with this new First Street alignment, we can use our First Street storm pipe as essentially a replacement to that pipe, with the exception from the portion from Willard, Windsor Village Park to Eastman Park Drive. This piece would still have to stay in service. But the rest of it, after meeting with the uh, Parks Open Space Manager, I believe we can probably abandon the rest of it, which would be really a good thing to get rid of that pipe because it'd just be a nightmare to try to work on it, going through yards and everything. So this is a hydraulic model that was put together. It's a two-dimensional model. So when Carl it, it kind of goes fast, but you'll see the uh, flooding <coughs> show up over in this area. And the depth of flooding kind of depends on the, the colors. This is in what kind of scenario? This is kind of an existing condition, 100 year type of storm. So like a 1% annual flood risk. Carl, would you be able to Play it again and then pause it and then try to pull the bar back. Kind of. Okay. But you'll see up in the uh, care housing um, apartments and kind of up along Kenosha Court and in those areas, uh, it's pretty evident that it was pretty significant impact. So we have experienced flooding in these areas in the past? Uh, like in those photos, you know, there's a lot of street flooding and right up next to the building. It's always really hard to know exactly what's going on if you're not right on site or someone has a movie of it or a picture or something. Were those like 2013 photos? That probably, it was probably around then. Or yeah, 2013, like massive 2014. Massive torrential downpour, that, you know, is two inches and 30 miles. 
Yeah, the storm would be pretty significant, you know, with a 1% flood risk. But in hydrology, it's always just kind of a statistical thing. You know, there's every year it's a 1% risk of that happening. You know, you could go a long time and nothing happens, or you could have back-to-back -back storms, you know, one year to the next. And, uh, We have another question, Shane. Oh, sure. Who, uh, if, if we did experience flooding in these areas that did affect businesses, residential homes, etc., is that a SERSA claim? Is that a homeowner's insurance claim? I mean, what liability does the town have by doing or not doing this project, I guess? Is what I'm yeah, I, okay. So without an attorney here. Um, well, sure. I, I, I would. A good way, anyway. <laughs> 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 Usually the, the town's liable if, if there's a risk, if we've identified a risk and we haven't addressed it. So if you walk and you trip on a sidewalk and we didn't know about it, we have to get in this program, we're not liable. If, if we've got three people trip on it and we know about it, and the fourth person trips and knocks your teeth out, we've got some liability. So I think the same thing with, with drainage too. I mean, if, if we know we've got a risk, if we know we've got something and we fail to act, then I think there is some liability there. Uh, but again, I don't know that it's, you know, we could say, geez, you know, we only have a half million dollars and we'll, we'll make this phase one into 10 different phases. I think as long as we're making progress, that's still okay. But I, I don't think doing nothing is a, is a defensible action. But the, the stormwater study that was done did show that this was Need to be done. So. Yeah, the project comes straight out of the town's stormwater <coughs> master plan. Paul, to answer, this does flood from time to time over the years. It always, it always has good, good downpour. Um, I've seen it pop up uh, water, sewer uh, rates up. Okay. Okay. I have a question on the funding source. It says impact fees. Is that the same as sewer, stormwater? Well, it's stormwater. Storm 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 yes. And there's two kind of sources on those impact fees. One would be at the time of building permits, and then there's also the uh, monthly stormwater charge that you'll see on your water bill. So that would go to projects like this, uh, as well as kind of operation and maintenance. It's sort of split on the homeowner portion that's paid. But stormwater is one of those areas where we're not keeping that, though. Right? That's right. I, 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 that. That, that's right. And I've talked to actually, I'm glad I have Doug here. Um, we're going to go and, and have a future work session with the board to talk about that. But he was here when we developed kind of the fees and um, uh, has a great basis of understanding of how we designed it. And really, I think that it was designed to try to keep up on the capital side is where the money's supposed to go. There's really never any money set aside on the operation side. And that's where we see the right. hole is, is we have like our MS4 program and we say, okay, we've got our storm grade people. How do we pay them? There, there's no money that's being generated right now to do that. And our mosquito program comes out of that fund as well. And so we're spending right now about $92,000 a year to for a mosquito control. And it goes up every three years, uh, a certain percentage. So we, we need to take all of that into consideration when we look at <coughs> raising the fees to accommodate what our future needs are going to be. <coughs> And we had just completed a couple of very large storm drainage projects, the West Trib project and then the Law Drainage Channel project that really kind of drained the fund. <coughs> and the fees that are collected, it was kind of based on a 30-year build-out of our storm drainage improvements. It, we didn't never assume you know, we'd be able to fund it all right away, you know, but kind of pacing it over time. And then doing the inflationary adjustment on the cost estimates and uh, stormwater fees annually. Okay, here's the proposed model um, that the consultant put together kind of after the improvements are put in place. So do you want to go back, Carl? Or <coughs> It has significant reduction, and, and also, I don't know if you noticed on the first uh, run of it, Tolmar was pretty impacted down in their parking lot, 
you know, and we get complaints from them, and they did some of their own improvements down there, but this really has a big benefit for them as well. Yeah. Eric, it looks like we should move Chimney Park Pool to that orange. Thousands of dollars are paid every year. Splash Park. Splash Park. And we've had uh, discussions with the care housing, let's say uh, low income housing complex. And we're going to have to move their playground as part of uh, the drainage improvements. And they kind of went to the playground, relocated anyhow, so they went up, up closer to the front of the building where they could see the kids instead of kind of tucked in behind where it's at now. You're talking about the care facility? Yeah. And what, what, did we, what, did we, what did we or what do we require in terms of landscaping there? Because it's, it's bare to none. That's not meeting the standards, I don't think, of some of our other facilities and wherever they grandfather in. I mean, because in the back there, it's just really, it's weeds and they do mow. But um, I don't know, is there anything if we could make that improvement that we can force them to do any other kind of improvement in terms of the landscaping that's around that facility? Right. Scott, do you, do you have any history with the care facility or? No. The, uh, I think that site plan is probably from the 1980s or something in that range and it would have predated our current landscape standards but if there is an opportunity with this project without sure. affecting the budget, um, I think it would be a good time to do that. So the part impacting uh, care housing would be in the phase two, which <coughs> the way I put it in the budget was building phase one in 2020, and that'd be the first street storm sewer along with the Folkstone detention pond improvements. And then skip a year to kind of let that drainage fund build back up and then do the phase two the following year. And so this model shows both phases being implemented up? Yeah, yeah. And there might still be a little bit of an issue? Yeah, yeah, because care housing wouldn't see any benefit from phase one. That would totally be kind of phase two. That's at 3.9 gets in the packet. Yeah. So did you did you calculate in the phase two since it's not gonna happen until twenty twenty two any future cost escalation? Yeah, we put that? I put contingency in there too. And then we'll, you know, again anything <coughs> beyond twenty twenty is just kind of a forecast right now. So the, these numbers will really have a hard look um, when we're in twenty twenty one and trying to update everything. Um, and, and so, Doug, can you make the note at least um, right now when we're interacting with CARE to see if we can put some kind of landscaping budget or at least okay. have that conversation sure. with them? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure they would appreciate that. Okay. So. I think that's all I had on that project. Hello, I'm Dessa Blair. I'm an engineer with the town. Um, I am also proposing a master drainage plan project. Um, so during major storm events, there's flooding occurs at Stone Mountain Drive and 10th Street. So I'll run through this project. I think it's easier on the next slide to see. Um, so Anderson Consulting Engineers did a study a couple years ago and determined that the way to alleviate this flooding would be to um, break up this project in five parts. Uh, so downstream to upstream to orient, let's see, north is to your right. This is Main Street, 7th Street, 11th Street. So this project, <coughs> um, like I said, it's in five parts. Um, first part would be to upsize this channel south here of the Whitney Ditch. And then second is a siphon of the Whitney Ditch. Third is to upsize this channel here from Stone Mount Drive to um, Cooter Park Detention Pond. And then we're going to upsize the culverts here at Stone Mount Drive and then do a few improvements here to the 10th Street drainage channel. Um, so we've broken this up, if you can go to the next slide. 
um, into the next four years. Um, next year will be the Whitney Ditch Siphon. Um, so that'll be about 60 feet of the Whitney Ditch will be siphoned under 10th Street drainage um, channel. And then if you go to the next slide, um, the second part will be to improve the channel from Stone Mountain Drive culverts <coughs> down to the Hooter Park Detention Pond. And that will be just upsizing that existing channel. And then we'll also have to design the culverts as part of this project this next year so that we can tie into it. And then over the next four years, we'll complete the rest of the project. I think we're shown on that first slide. Can somebody explain where the Cooter, Cooter Park detention pond is? Where? It's kind of behind the Catholic Church. I don't know if we go back to that first or that second <coughs> slide. Because right? I'm looking at it compared to the Lafayette Lakes above it there. It's to the north of the dog park in Eastman. Yeah. So it's right on the curve as you come down. It's right sure. behind the old police chief's house. I have a question on the fund used. It says fund Yeah, that's an error. Oh, it should okay. be the drainage fund. Oh, thanks. <coughs> you weren't supposed to catch it. Sorry. This next project uh, acquisition of easements for the storm sewer extension. This is something that Dennis had uh, had put in the budget documents, and I've been trying to learn a little more about what it's about. So, kind of the origin of this is it kind of dates back to the Rocky Mountain <coughs> Sports Park when they were going to be going up uh, north of Harmony Road and how to get sewer to them. And there were different uh, sewer plans put together. There was a force main version and then a gravity system, uh, kind of preliminary design put together. And what this project represents is acquiring easements for the gravity system associated with that. Yeah, and, and I would just say um, a couple things here. One is, is we have two other partners. So we have um, John Turner's Metro District as well as the County Severance, and they're paying for a third of this as well. So we'd all set a pot of money aside. Phase one included um, easements for sewer and just understanding the, um, you know, that eventually we're going to build a sewer line. We don't know when, but we know we're going to build it. We know now where it needs to go and we have our design for that. And so the decision was made to go through and acquire easements now, just understanding that it will never get less expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, it will just become less likely if somebody goes in and plots a subdivision in the county over where we intend for the sewer line to be, um, we've wasted all of our design money. And so we have kept our project partners up to date. They understand that we're continuing on with the acquisition. We're giving them, <coughs> I think, a quarterly update as far as money expended. And I think the group decided, even though knowing that Rocky Mountain Sports Park is not happening north, it was still the best case and the and smartest use of public's money to continue the acquisition of the right way. So, so that's what this represents. Is this our third, or is this the total? I think this is the total, and then it, right. it'll, yeah. So our ours would be divided by three. So it doesn't include what the three parties or what we already had put into it. Like we had already collected some money. We, 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 we did, and so we're still drawing from that, Mayor. So from the town side. So does that go against this, or that's an addition? To no, it? that goes against this. <coughs> so um, I think we collected six hundred thousand total. Is that right? Is it two hundred thousand a party? No, it was. Uh, it was half a million from each of us. Okay, so yeah, one point five million. So we're still drawing from that. So this would be the total cost to finish out the easement acquisitions, um, and we'll draw a third from each partner and a third from the town. So this. So will there be still will be money left over even after, be. and then that will go towards the future I, potential build out. I, I think that once we're done money. with phase one, we will reimburse our project partners, and unless at that time we've all agreed to do going to construction, I think our project partners would get reimbursed while we hadn't expended. Has this easement acquisition already been negotiated? 
Uh, I, mean, I like a fairly exact. I yeah, so, I don't think it has. From I, I think some sections have been, and I think there's some. I <clears> believe it. Budget, right? like, <laughs> don't, don't go to six twenty nine, or we're going to have to. Yeah. <laughs> I, I believe it was based on an appraisal that was completed. Now, whether or not the property owner accepted the appraisal, that would be the other question. And some of this has been, you know, John Turner has taken the lead on some of these, talking to the, the property owners. It's been a bit of a uh, moving target for this. But it is. And, and this is just for the lower one mile section. This would be all the way from Harmony Road all the way down to Greenspire because okay. the town already acquired the Brenneman easement. That one's been secured. That goes all the way out to 257. That was the project that was going to cost, like, what, six million? No, 26 million? To <coughs> six million. Well, it, 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 went, it, went from, it went from six to 18 or 19 yeah. million. <coughs> I, I mean, so we'll acquire the easements, but. <laughs> you think <laughs> well it's and again we, we know this this um north interceptor is going to get built we, we know we need it um or we will need it as the town continues to develop to the north uh, we also know that naturally what happens is on um, normally development will connect onto existing and they'll build a small section of it and then that the next development will build and so I don't know that the town will end up building it. I don't know that we'll construct it. It may just be constructed privately, but at least we'll have a plan. We'll know it works. We'll have the easements. And then uh, Mr. Turner did uh, meet with his contractor and did get um, a number that was kind of in between the two. Mm -hmm. You know, it's higher than our initial estimate, but it was far less than the 18 or 19 million we had. I don't know if our engineers remember. It was like. I, I yeah, thought I, I saw something in the uh, <coughs> a bid from Gerard, or where they got some numbers from yep. Gerard excavating. That's right. Is it still following, following the last plan that we saw through the one major property owner? He was the biggest Yeah, I, I don't have a, a slide of it, but this yeah. is the alignment I found in the file that matches uh, kind of the properties that are shown in the easement description. So it runs parallel to uh, 257 and then kind of follows the ditch up over to 74. Here's the 255. Everybody else is. <laughs> Well, I, I think that the property owner we that I'm familiar with, Mayor, um, where we had our lift station, it didn't want it there. We're going to need to move that lift station back. Um, now that it's mostly gravity, I don't so even think. Yeah, so I, I think it's starting to end. You know, once it's put in, I think that specific property owner understands how um, how much more his property will be worth once the town puts this in. So I don't I don't think he's. I, mean, I think he's willing to negotiate for himself, but I don't think he is um, going to be a hard adverse possession. And something I would point out on the numbers in the uh, CIP request, it has money in there for survey and legal fees. Um, but I have no idea if that 133000 covers like a right-of-way acquisition consultant or, or what that all entails, you know, because we would have to have the uh, surveys completed, legal descriptions, and there'd be some cost associated with that. So it looks like there's something in there, you know, to hire a third party to help acquire the easements. I think that's it for engineering. Well, yeah, it's not. It's not exactly. Yeah, I think for because Dennis is taking a lead, and this was just another project that doesn't really get turned over. I, I'm sorry, we don't have more detail on what exactly is in there. Um, but yeah, I don't. I don't think it's, that's going to be exactly the amount we spend. 
but I think that what's important is we continue to acquire easements and we continue to move forward with that, especially since we have kick funding partners that are paying the curve of it. It's, it's the best deal the town will ever have right now. IT. Hi, I'm Corinne Millington, the IT manager. Uh, I have a few projects up here that uh, I'm going to present to you today. The website replacement improvement, this actually is a continuation of our 2019 efforts uh, for the website. Uh, since this year, actually, we've made a decision to move forward with the current vendor, Civic Plus, and so we're just continuing the redesign of the website, so that'll carry into 2020. The next one is uh, security tools. So what we're proposing here is adding in some additional security into our networking environment. This is intrusion uh, prevention types of tools to, to make sure that we're uh, managing the network and making sure that the we're preventing any intrusions coming into the network. We currently don't have that, so we're asking to put something like that in. Great. Green, could you let them know, you sent out a stat a while back and talked about how many municipalities and local governments have been victims of malware and um, um, Yeah, actually in August, I, I put some stats out in the, in the last uh, email that went out, but 22 Texas municipalities were, uh, had ransomware attacks on them. They had a common software program between all of them, which is how the uh, intruders were able to get in. So once they got into one, they were able to get into all of the rest of them. So having these types of tools in place would help prevent those types of activities from occurring here. We have some safeguards in place, and so far we're doing really well with that, but we need to continue down that path and um, continue to be ahead of the game so that we don't fall into that kind of scenario here in Windsor. Yeah, we know like CDOT lost, and when they were hacked a couple years ago, um, they, they lost 20 years of data. They, they, yeah. they were completely lost. Uh, Atlanta um, was hacked, and they were lost. This would have been a perfect tool for something like that. What they found out in, in DOD as well is that a lot of times what happens is they find a way into your system and sometimes they can't get to other places until they figure out a way to do that. So sometimes they're in your systems for years uh, before you would even know that yeah, somebody is actually horse, waiting. Just, waiting, <coughs> just waiting for an opportunity and they keep probing different areas to see where they can get to next and they start building that those layers within your network and then eventually taking it over. Are we contracted with and are we still going to be contracting with Civic Plus to be the website? Yes. So is this 60,000, what do they charge? Is this all, is that 60,000 being paid to them to make these improvements? Or what is yes, that? and then it comes yeah. two new websites for one for PD, one for parks and recreation. And then what's our annual, because I know we have to pay them annually. It's about fifteen thousand. Huh? It's about fifteen thousand. So they don't have. It, is are these security tools coming from them, or no. is this? This so is they don't provide separate. Any security tools in for the website or, itself. Website? Yeah, there is something included with the current uh, contract that we're negotiating with them to add a layer of security into the website itself. But that's not our network. So the next uh, line item is specifically for our network. That other 60 brand. Yes. Right. Shane, something that I guess we've heard about is with ransomware in particular, if your system is entirely backed up on a routine basis, then when they ask for a million dollars to get your data back, you go, yeah, yeah we lost the data already. Yep. Uh, do, we, do we already back up our system? Yes. So that, that was where it was. And also for this year, uh, we did approve getting uh, actual physically separated storage area. So we will be doing that this year as well. That's one of our current projects is to, uh, we back up our files all the time, but it's not, it's on the same network. And what, we, what we're going to do this year, what we were already approved for was to create a separate, physically separate, so there's no way that anybody could ever intrude that space. 
Well, and I think have it, a I don't know if it was Atlanta or CDOT, but some somebody had backed up, but they basically backed up the hacked information. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so that's another thing is that basically they, they erased all their good information, hacked information, and, and I don't know how you get around that. Yeah. Lots, <laughs> lots of way, lots of things for us to still continue to work on. And we're learning so much. I mean, we're involved in the security discussions with other municipalities, just trying to stay on top of what are they doing and what are we seeing? What are we learning from like CDOT? And what are we learning from these other municipalities that have been attacked and how can we better prevent that from it, occurring anywhere else? It, it not to get into the operations side, but the board may recall the last year, uh, IT request that we approved a security position in IT and we were just unable to fill that role. It's just, um, <coughs> there's not a lot of people who are doing that. And so um, we've kind of redoubled our efforts and decided instead of filling that position, um, all of our IT staff are going to go and get security training and we'll tools like this in place to just try to, to put up as much of a firewall as we can. It's because anyone who knows how to do it is on the hacking side. They can make way more. <laughs> or it's just like, I mean, you know, Corinne is brilliant. She knows what we want, but I think that, that her person is already like, you know, doing it for HP or somebody, you know, like I think that. It's, yeah. There's not a lot of people who do it super well, and they are the ones that are highly employed. They're doing it well. They have yep. made it before yeah. they create so. Sort of related to this, Shane, and I guess, Karen, sorry, but I'm not, I'm not seeing it here. And it reflects the time I was at Frontier in particular. There was always a discussion of a redundant operations center or a disaster recovery plan. If, there's a, if all of your servers are in town hall and there's a fire in town hall, you're done. Right. Mm -hmm. so, that, so if you're backing up your entire system, but you're backing it up off-site or creating a redundant small operating yes. area that's so, remote. So, so we, that's budgeted for this year. So that's something that the board approved okay. last year for this year. Mm -hmm. And so we're still working on that. I mean, okay. that's going to be done this year, right? Well, we the redundant. So we had a two-phased right. uh, plan that we had for network redundancy. Um, we're pushing off that second phase so that we can get the, the facilities master plan results in, because we thought we better wait for that if there's a plan to have a building. Ideally, you would like to have something at least five miles away or in a different geographically located place so that you don't have the same issue happen um, that could kill both, both sides of your network. So our plan was actually, we, to, for uh, 2019, we're replacing, we're actually in the middle of replacing the network, we're relocating it, the primary to PD. Uh, it's a much better facility, uh, not in the basement, so that's a really good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're in the middle of doing that. We're pushing off the second phase of that, would, which will create a, a redundant uh, location. And the reason is for just to make a better decision on where to put that. So, um, so we had talked about last year, though, the possibility was to take and do it just kind of on the cloud and back it up somewhere. That's our, that's our kind of interim plan, is to, is to have a location on the cloud so that we can keep our information secure and safe um, outside of our network in case there ever was some kind of disaster, whether it be um, you know, an actual physical environmental disaster of some kind or a natural disaster <coughs> or uh, something targeting a malware. This was one last year we were joking around about the bunker. Remember the, the bunker that was like five miles away or something like yeah. that where we would have, maybe not in the ground, but I remember we were, the, the topic of this off-site location five miles away came up. Designated survival. Uh, we do have a couple well, places. Yeah, I think it should be. Tonight, that's yeah. Ken Bennett, by the way. He's a designated survivor. <laughs> not. So, so the other part <laughs> was too. But I think it sounds like you're sure sure up the, the, the network. You have the redundant data. And you want to shore it up by having it at multiple sites in the cloud. But this is really protecting the network because I mean, you can have redundant data, but it can be redundant copies of corrupted data, or you can't get to it because they've taken the network. Exactly. This helps so us. This, this, this type really of software, right? Data, right? Exactly. Yeah. This software will help us identify issues like that yeah. and issues that we can't see without digging deep you know, into information we just can't, we don't have the manpower to do that kind of work. So having a tool that would be able to identify that type of uh, 
oddities that are occurring within the system that could help point those out to us. So then we could take a look at uh, that to see what's going on. That would help. I mean, that's what we have to do next. Um, on the redundancy piece too, just something, uh, this is still in discussions, but we've had discussions with other municipalities um, in the areas to talk about maybe doing a joint type of location. So rather than us spending the money to do a secondary location here in Windsor, uh, sharing that cost with other municipalities who would be interested in doing the same thing to create a space where we could share that cost instead. Or working with another municipality and, and using their data center to do our backup um, recovery mm -hmm. with. So just different things that we're throwing out there. So. Um, yeah, we're currently, Terry and I are working with uh, Lori Hodges with the uh, Denver County to come up with a ULC, yeah. and that was one of the concepts was to share space, and so they're looking at a couple spots off of 34 in that area, not 25. Yeah, that would be a great opportunity for us to partner with them and share that and put our redundant site there. Any Sorry. other questions on that? The third one is a continuation of our point-to-point -point fiber. Uh, for this part, we are moving, uh, putting some uh, fiber in uh, at the water treatment facility. And I think in the paperwork we talked about Eastman Park, but we're, we're going to flop those because it's a little bit easier to get down into Eastman Park than it is into Chimney Park right now. We're running into a couple little uh, issues with that. So we're going to push Chimney Park to next year and continue that effort there, then. Then we have business analytics. So this one is a proposal to put some software in place that would help, uh, like for IT purposes, we have a lot of different tools that capture information about security-related events. So things that are happening on the firewall, for instance, but we also have software that tracks malware that's occurring within the environment on computers um, and all those types of things. And it's really hard for us to get a clear picture of what's going on because all of these software packages are different vendors, different solutions that we have within our environment. So it's, it started with that kind of concept, but this is something that kind of blends into other departments as well. If, if we can find the right tool to put in place, they also have similar challenges with different software programs that they have that do different things for them. So finding a <coughs> smart way to link data sets is really what business analytics is all about. So it gives you a clearer picture of what's going on within your departments and your teams and helps kind of bring forth and highlights the important information related to that so you can make better decisions about what to do next. Have you seen similar software being used at other yes. towns and seen the results of that? Yeah, it's a, it can be very powerful. Sure. Yeah. And there's many different tools out there. It'd be uh, more about, we, we looked at a few, uh, so we'd have to sit down with the departments too and, and show them what we're seeing and try to make a decision about which one might work the best. Yeah, you know, I agree. This one is the one that's maybe it still needs to be baked a little bit more for me. Yeah, I, I see what it can do, but I also think, you know, I think IT will take the tool and, and apply it and do a great job. And I just don't know if there's going to be enough buy-in, some finance, or planning, or other departments. So I think if I want to get the departments involved with it, everybody can kind of understand what it can do, because I just don't want to, it seems like if we could put it uh, to use the way that Krim describes it would be great, but I don't want to use get it and have <laughs> All these different department heads say, well, I'm too busy and we don't know what I can do for this. And so I think we want to, I'd like to request that we put it in the budget for your consideration, uh, but we're going to still do some more work before we um, are ready to pull the trigger. Chief, it'll report to you analytically, you should have less crime. We should have. That would help you. <laughs> The last one is a continuation of our 2019 efforts as well for security access control. 
Um, and specifically for next year, the big part of that number is for PD replacement of their camera system. So there's uh, cameras, additional cameras that we need to install, and there's cameras that are not sufficient for the needs that they have. Uh, so also some voice recording included with some of that. So uh, we're looking at doing that next year. So that's all at, all at PD or is that a town hall? Or, or About 30,000 of that or a little over that is PD. Okay, any questions for Frank? You need engineering to help you next time. All your numbers are even ending in zeros. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And all one slide. I could change that. We get the parts. <laughs> I could be more precise. <laughs> we better break for dinner. <laughs> so so uh, we, we are going to have dinner served uh, coming at 530. Oh. So we have about 30 minutes. So I think, I don't know if anybody needs a restroom break right now before we uh, have our start. I have everybody, uh, I have everybody. <laughs> we all might need an acid pills. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Are you okay with that, Mayor? Maybe taking five, ten minutes for a restroom break? I think so. Yeah, I don't have my camera. Mm -hmm. All right, ready? No. No. <laughs> Eric Lucas, Parks, Recreation, and Culture. You've probably never heard me say this, but I am going to make this as fast as possible. And this is why. I'm in the middle of a three, three day, this is my third day of a nine day elk hunt. So I want to get back to the mountains. I'd really rather not be here. And I haven't showered since Friday, so you probably don't want me walking around to you. So if I come around, and you smell me, that's why. Well, I'm, you're done. I'm in the middle of an open. So, uh, first slide is Diamond Valley. So, you can see that on the slide here. And to be quite honest with you, um, after last Friday's meeting, I'm now cautiously optimistic that we won't have to spend this $4 million that's on the, on the screen for this project. It felt much better last, after last week's meeting. Um, but we want to keep it in the budget just in case the Future Legends doesn't. Um, meet their deadline of building a multi-purpose field by March of next year. They are, I think Shane's last email went out to, late on Friday to the board uh, as an update, but they are on, on a tight timeline. They've ordered sod, uh, so it, it looks like they're moving along. Uh, but again, we should budget for this just in case they don't meet their, their guidelines or their deadlines out. So with that being said, on the screen and in the chart, you'll see there's a black line there. The caveat to this four million is, if they fail to meet their, the agreement that you all have with them, um, we lose this 50 acres down here. So the plan itself would have to get changed a little bit because the road wouldn't come all the way out to uh, Eastman Park Drive. We'd probably have to create some of a loop system within, within the park. But it still would include the multi-purpose field, 600 by 600 lit uh, for baseball, football, soccer, lacrosse, those kind of things, uh, restroom, and parking and road improvement. So, that is there uh, as a placeholder with our fingers crossed that they meet, meet the deadline of March of next year. Um, the other piece on the screen you'll see is there's $220,000 in FF&E for things like, and, and this is under the assumption that they do meet their deadline, things like scoreboards, soccer goals, um, all kinds of other things that they would need, <coughs> that we would need to operate out there. So um, that's what that is there for, for temporary fencing, um, th those kind of things. So either way, we're, we need to budget for both with our fingers crossed that we won't spend the four million. Um, that money is out of park improvement fund. So you wanna click the next one? So before, we, before well, you get hold plugged. Hold on, I'm sorry, let's just, I, I know you're in a hurry, but I wanna ask before we move on, before you guys have any questions about the Diamond Valley um, pleasure request. Only that if, we, <laughs> if, if they do it, this four million isn't available to him to do whatever else you <laughs> Yes, sir. I, I, <laughs> it, it, I mean, I, I We got that on video. And, uh, <laughs> no, that's just, just, actually, quite honestly, the way the budget is built, I don't, I hope, pray that we don't have to spend this for me because we have these other places. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah. see? We don't want to spend it. Right. We, we don't want to spend it. Yeah. We, we did have, uh, we've had some very productive meetings with the principals of uh, Future Legends. Um, and, you know, what my hope would be is they get far enough ahead this year to where we can drop this out of this year's requested budget 
before the board ever adopts it. Mm -hmm. Because if we have to put it in for next year, things are getting pretty tight with the time. Correct. Yeah, and really, to get their SOD established, they should really have it done this year. Um, and how much did they see? 185,000 square feet yes. SOD? Right. Yeah, so. And it would have to be graded, installed, irrigated, and. Yeah, I think they said November 1st. November 1, and that's potentially pushing a given weather. Yeah. Well, and, and part of <coughs> going back a year, part of this, <coughs> this not being spent because of the agreement we had with Colorado National Sports Park and us not having to spend the $4 million was how we were justifying. We were rolling that money over into the facility that we see next door. I mean, that was part of the well, capital well, outlay. No, but we, mean, didn't, we didn't roll any no. park fees into that. I, I think it was just more uh, looking at our... What the overall... Yeah, yeah, the, the $25 million or whatever we have in unmet park needs. Correct. I mm -hmm. think that's kind of where that... Correct. Where that but aren't we going to be responsible for maintenance? No. They, they are responsible for maintenance. We will make a $24,000 oh, annual okay. payment okay. that okay. can increase annually based on some... some I forget the, what, what statistic we used. But well, that's the ongoing the, annual, but then we'd have a one-time 220 to get... No, yeah, so this one time is 220. We would own these things, like soccer goals, scoreboards, but we would need to put them out there. Now, if during construction they put them out there, we wouldn't have to spend the money, but there's no agreement that says we're going to buy 50 soccer goals in their years. So that's what we need. <clears throat> And, and we maybe the scoreboards would go up, but I think that our position should be that we're buying all of these. There's no reason that they would. Correct. But these wouldn't be capital assets, right? I mean, it, what's the goal? But the soccer goal that lasts five to ten years. Yeah. Well, I know, but it has to be five thousand dollars or more per item. Not e each individual item wouldn't be. We'll, we, we've lumped it all into one group. If if they're accountant, is that? I mean, you could you lump your assets in order to reach a Capital If we were building the, so my interpretation is if we were building the park as a whole, we would build, we would buy those assets as one within the construction project versus buying them separately, which would then be uh, just an operating function and come out of general fund. By doing it this way, it comes out of the park fund as, as if we were building the whole park complex at once. Okay. So and I think you just because it's such a large expenditure, two hundred twenty thousand, it it seemed like we should just highlight that for the board and let you know it's going out, um, and it'll be paid out of the, the park. The park improvement, fund. and it's it's totally eligible out of park improvement. So it's it's being presented tonight as the capital just because it's such a large purchase. Right. Um, but you're right. If we took each goal, you couldn't really capitalize that and say, geez, this two thousand dollar goal should be capitalized. Yeah, I mean, in your materials, you. You know, FF and E, classic example, but you're going to buy 100 desks, which comes to a large number, but each desk is... That, that's right. That's right. Okay. So next one, um, <coughs> before we put play, many of you have kind of seen this a little bit throughout the summer uh, as an introduction for different things, such as the Youth Academy that we had. Uh, but I wanted to thank Matt Krause, who did the drone video, and Mackenzie for putting this together. Um, this takes about a minute and kind of intro the project, and then I'll get into the details and break it down for you. Go ahead. Nestled between the mountains and the plains, you will find the town of Windsor, a growing northern Colorado community, rich in historical and recreational opportunities, and home to the Cache Laputa River, one of three national heritage areas in Colorado. Unfortunately, the true beauty of the Cache Laputa, as it meanders through Windsor, is only seen from afar. Except for a few locations along the Poudre Trail connecting Windsor and Greeley, most of the river is inaccessible due to private property. Now is the time to change all of that. Now is the time to invest in conservation, in health and wellness, and in social equity by investing in a river walk that provides everyone in our community access to our river. 93% of residents believe that our parks and recreation system makes Windsor a more desirable place to live. They rank the following as their top priorities for investment in the future. River access and river walk, walking, biking, and hiking trails, natural areas, wildlife habitat, boating, canoeing, and kayaking, and botanical gardens in an arboretum. A river walk at Eastman Park would address all of these priorities to a growing community that values recreation and is hungry for more.
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Zero musical skills. How did we get Wilford Brimley in his? <laughs> <laughs> So this project didn't start off as a river walk. Uh, I'd like to give you a little back history on this as we get into the details. But in 2015 in October, I started uh, here with the town. And the department was in the middle of the Eastman Park South master plan. So the property south of the river, which is right here. Most of what you see here in the proposed river walk was adopted by the town board in about April of 2016 as the Eastman Park South master plan. So a lot of that was already there in, in, in place and ready to go. We plugged that into, into the 2019 CIP and then last year as we were discussing it internally, bumped it to 2020. So I, I don't want you to think that the Riverwalk just came about, that title. The, the Eastman Park South Master Plan got adopted, and so some things got added to it along the way based surely upon the growth that has happened here in Windsor. So um, the things that we're really addressing, and I want to share with you that my staff left me markers. They probably don't work because they're all Broncos colors. But I'll hey, too soon. <laughs> <laughs> but I will try them. Um, so a couple of things that happened, and what, what you'll see as we get into this project in the next three slides, is parking capacity. That's this portion of the project up here. It's actually on the north side. So I'll circle that right here. Yeah, see, they don't work, I told you. <laughs> um, parking right here. We have a major parking issue. Go by on soccer Saturdays or baseball in the summer. We have a shared parking agreement with the church just to our north, but we, they, they're growing. They just built an expansion. They have a great big congregation. And then also we have a great big congregation of people that play sports at Eastman Park South. Yeah, so we're having more and more events. Like they had one this previous Saturday. Yeah. Okay. And it's. And so they, they overflow onto us, we overflow onto them. So Eastman Park Drive here comes through. And what we're proposing in phase one of the river walk in, in next year is putting in parking down here, which will help some of their issues, some of our issues. And because right now what we're doing is we are actually having to do overflow parking down in here in the south side to, to, to handle uh, the, the, the conflict that we're having right now with the church. So that is part of, and that's, that's parking capacity, it wasn't included in the Eastman Park South master plan, but within this project we've added it there. Um, trail, that trail access, so there's many trails throughout this system. There's trails down to the water, there's walking trails with uh, proposed artwork along uh, throughout the property here. Environmental education, getting kids down into the river. Um, you, many of you probably grew up skipping rocks, turning rocks over and looking for crayfish, catching frogs, those kind of things. P kids don't do that today. They see their animals. On a, on a TV screen, on an iPad. We want to get them into the river, get them down in there so they can actually see, touch, feel, and learn. So that's what environmental education is. Water access, as you saw on the slide, and what you've seen in the uh, PRC uh, strategic plan that we're in the middle of doing, you saw the results. River access is number one in terms of what people would like to see investment in. So it would, we would have a put in from here and a take in down, take out down here. It, this is once, once completed, will allow you to float one mile within Windsor. You don't have to go to Fort Collins. Um, you saw in the video the little kids in the kayaks, that water was literally this deep. And they were able to float their kayaks. Um, I think Tara's uh, husband took her, her, their kids three days later, and they did it two or three times. They had a blast. The youth group that we had, the, uh, the student leadership group, that came through this summer, they had a blast doing it. So again, getting people in right here in Windsor and doing that. Treasure Island Gardens, this allows some expansion there, especially when it comes to educating people about non-potable water um, and, and the use of what they can do in landscaping. We've talked to John. Uh, you'll, you'll see some more changes in our operations budget, but this would allow us to expand that as well. Um, flood mitigation down in here. So when we do have flooding, there's some plantings there. And then some more activities like special use camping, access to the water for fishing and those kind of things. I've caught trout down by Kodak uh, Trailhead. Believe it or not, fly fishing for carp is an activity. I see people doing it all the time at 13. 
uh, at the river there. So again, that's, these are the things that we would address the needs in, in phase one. So you wanna click the next one? So phase one costs, just so you know. It's $4 million, uh, parking improvements, water access, elevated plaza and beach. And when I say beach here, it's more like, move, it's, it's really moving the trail a little bit to the kind of northwest, creating a cut into the bank, putting some large boulders like what they've done over at uh, Fort Collins, if you've been over there to see their project, allowing people to go down, you can sit, and creates a great corridor to look up the river towards the bridge on the Pooter, uh, the Pooter Trail and watch people use the river or you can sit there and read a book, those kind of things. Um, expanding Treasure Island Garden, learning labs, flood mitigation, and fishing and uh, camping access are the, are the other pieces to it. Click the next one. So future, this is down the road. I've plugged it in, in phase, I think three phases, every three years. How we pay for the rest of it? I don't know. I do know that if we do phase one and that's all we do, we have addressed all of the top needs that were mentioned in the video that people wanted that came out of the PRC strategic plan in the study that we just, or the survey that we just did. We would address every single one of them if we only did phase one. And if we do phase two, three, four, and, and however we figure out how to pay for it, it adds bridges across here to connect kind of the uh, Eastman Park South and North. It adds a bridge over here between the trails that would go in in the future uh, for the disc golf course area over to the Pooter Trail there. It would add a nature playground. Business and economic development. There's property right here that does not flood. If we have people floating the river and they put in up here and they take out down here, why can't they stop and get a coffee, have a beer, grab something to eat? So economic development is also a potential you know, in the future phase. And we can own this, we don't have to build it. Sell that portion to a developer, let them build it in. We collect the sales tax. Um, other pieces are trails and, and uh, pump track in here, and potentially a zip line across the river. But again, that's future phasing. Don't know how we're gonna pay for the 11 million down the road. We'll figure that out. Worst case, by doing phase one, we've addressed many needs that the residents have said they'd like. Questions. Can you back up the, the phase ones and sure. talk about that? Questions. And so this is all comes funding all comes from Park Improvement Fund, with the exception of a small grant that we believe we would get from the Pooter Heritage Alliance. Yes, sir. Yeah, just it, it seems kind of the obvious to potentially have a kayak rental. Um, kayak rental up at the input area that people don't like, love their kayaks. Do you envision that? I, I, I think we potentially could get into that in the future. Uh, right now, I think kind of self service works, gets the ball rolling. If we see that the public uses it to the point that we could benefit by doing that, then absolutely. My biggest concern, Eric, <coughs> being open minded about this project is you know, having lived here for almost 13 years, the scene, there was many years where we had a big spring runoff, et cetera. The Poudre River gets, can come out of its banks, especially mm -hmm. in areas that are south over yeah, right in here. there. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe you need to explain more of the flood mitigation, but part of my concern is it's us doing serious you know, I know that there's that little swim beach or whatever that you have there on the north side, you know, et cetera, or, and, and things that are in whatever phase, but my concern is us putting a lot of money, possibly multi-millions of dollars, and then having things get washed away or damaged, or obviously that's a risk when you're dealing next to a natural resource, et cetera, I know. Can you explain anything more what either the flood, flood mitigation is or what things would go in that are up close and next to the river that if we did have high flows at certain times or a 13 flood again, things we can't predict, et cetera, yes. where we end up. Sure, so a couple of things. What we would put in here trail-wise, it's very similar to what Fort Collins has done. They've put trails down in, kind of in the riverbank, so probably annually in Fort Collins. I don't think it happens here unless we have a, 13, a year 13 annually. This is more crusher fine uh, rock paths. So if it floods, we have to come in there and refresh them, but it's not 
some huge capital investment that we lose. Please don't read into the word beach as a, as a beach like we're going to go to the beach and lay out on our blanket or that kind of thing. It really is kind of a graduated rock bench down to the, down to the river. So if it floods, it's not doing anything. It, it, it's, it's part of the so that do you see those like similar like uh, the city of Salida has one, I know Kansas City has built one, and it's, it's the same thing, you know, 51 weeks of the year, right. it's a nice place for a little swim beach, parents to hang out and read, watch your kids, look upstream, maybe a week of the year it's flooded out and it's just underwater. Right. And I also say I know that like uh, uh, Golden uh, from Gore Creek, like they've got sections, or Clear Creek rather, uh, sections that, that flood every year, and the PD just closes it and says, you know, don't right. drown, yeah. dummy, right. and it's Stay underwater out. for a couple weeks, Correct. and then it's back. So. so we would treat it the same way. And then in terms of the mitigation, there's, there's plantings, and, and what you're not seeing here, and I'll, I'll get into it in a second, there's plantings such as cottonwoods and those kind of things in here, uh, some, some natural vegetation to help with uh, flood mitigation there. What you're not seeing in here, and we're still trying to work through some iterations with NISP, is to potentially put a channel here. What, one thing, there's a bank, if you go there now, there's a big bank, we would cut that bank out so that if it does flood, <coughs> excuse me, the water kind of backs up in this direction. And potentially, if we work this out with NISP, we would cut you know, another channel here so that it can also move the water downstream and not create flooding there along. So we haven't worked those details out with them. We hope to do that in the future. But even if we didn't, some of this mitigation in this area, all these plantings would, would help. So I don't think that there is a very large, uh, massive capital that would wash downstream in your 13 scenario. There's some, but, it, but it's not so risk adverse that we would be like, you know, we're not gonna put $2 million right there and then it goes downstream next spring. Yes, sir. This looks really good. <coughs> My concern is that I know we did a master plan. Well, this is a brand new, it's never been budgeted even in long term that I know of. Maybe I'm forgetting. But we, I thought we had a shortage in our park fund for what we had already committed to do. And is this jumping ahead of projects that we are committed to do in the future for park, uh, neighborhood parks? No, we, we have the money set aside for neighborhood parks. Let me move back up a second. No and yes. No meaning we have the money for our neighborhood parks. The yes piece is we do not have the money for all of our community parks. But the big caveat was in the first slide that we showed, by the success of future legends, we don't have to spend the, I want to say, I can't remember what it was off the top of my head. Uh, Diamond Valley was something like 10 or $15 million, some ballpark like that. We're not spending that money there. So we've saved some of that money. We still have to build out Labu and Takankala. Uh, Those are the two big ones. The three, the, if you, if we have uh, Diamond Valley, Eastman Park South, Labu and Takankala. Diamond Valley, hopefully, fingers crossed, is off. This would be this one, and then we would be saving for future years for those remaining two parks. The shortfall probably is going to be in this park in Takankala because it's so large. It will involve sewer connections and all kinds of stuff like a turning lane. Yeah. So that when it comes to down the road, how do we pay for that park specifically is where I think our shortfall comes. This park was on the list to do anyway. Um, we had budgeted in 15, just this, something like 1.5 million, and that was in 15. So, so Eric, to be clear, so this is a part of the park's master plan? Yes, it is. And it, that, that park, just this piece, right here where my hand is, was approved, I think, in April of 16. But the whole concept is not part of the park's master plan. Not the river walk. Right. Not the water access. The Treasure Island Gardens, some community or botanical gardens, trails, water access on this side, yes. Flood mitigation, yes. 
my concern is we're exacerbating our problem with time to call. Potentially, but I think we saved a lot of money in the time of value deal. A lot. Could we get maybe another analysis? Sure. Showing, like, I remember seeing, like, mm -hmm. well, we're short, what are we going to do? We changed our ordinance to, yep. to well, combine to those two things. Maybe revisit that. Absolutely, I can bring that back to you. Well, along with that, maybe revisiting that master plan <coughs> just to see what it was. Sure. We were, but because this is just the cost to build this out. This, what's the cost? I mean, this is going to mean we have to have more people. Okay. We're going to have to have more maintenance. And so those are costs that aren't part of this $4 million. It's yet to be. Correct. There's, th there's maintenance costs there in terms of there's probably more trash. Um, you know, we, we're probably doing some edge mowing of the trails out in this area. Um, we would have done that on this side as well when we built the, when we were just building East Point Park South. That's why I stated don't get lost in the, the river walk term because the majority of this project was Eastman Park South. So if I, and I, I Tara, maybe you can pull up the, the master, the original master plan. So I, I think what I'm, what I'm hearing, because I don't want to get hung up on sure. this too much, but what I'm hearing is <coughs> we definitely need to review the parks master plan. I think it'd be good as a part of that presentation here to, to kind of feather out and just kind of show this is everything we intended to do and, and be really clear with the board, this is what would sure. be added to this. Um, and then obviously the board wants to uh, re-review <coughs> kind of our, our park funding, see kind of what the forecast is in the long term, uh, and then any other maintenance costs or anything else that yeah, we, we can think of that's going to add to this long term. Okay. Um, and not that I would expect you to, to see buying this out, but I think if this project moves forward, I think it would be worthwhile to look at what it would look like if we could maybe take what we want to do here and privatize it though. Because I mean, there may be an opportunity. I mean, maybe we don't have to own and operate something like this. There might be, I don't know, there might when, be an when you say, of some kind. When you say privatize, you, you're talking about like uh, David's suggesting in terms of like renting kayaks, that kind of thing? No, like to take over <coughs> the whole thing. Like a lot of botanic gardens are not, I mean, they're a, a private entity owns and operates that, and all of the things that exist around a Garden. Right, so for example, the, the Treasure Island Garden, if it grew, currently it's being run 100% by volunteers. I think you'll see a little bit of a slight shift right. in we are, operations. Yeah. We got, yeah. yeah. Okay. My other concern is we did that um, survey of our residents and trails and connectivity way at the top. I understand this has trails, but I think the intention of, I mean, I mean into it, but I think the residents want connectivity. So this has trails, but I don't think it has the connectivity that. Really I get what you're saying, and I think you'll see that in the next slide. Uh, I don't think he is going to see it because he doesn't think he's got it. So I'm <laughs> so, going to see what I want in the next slide. <laughs> well, I think you'll see progress. And, and know that. Look, look at the next does, does phase one have, and maybe you're going to get to it here, but because you, you and I had talked offline after the youth leadership thing about <clears throat> trails on the north side on that inner loop, you know. Uh, so here? No, like a cement trail on the, no, down by going around down here. Boat. Yeah, well, so no, trail this, the, on, these trails are in phase two, or three or four, whenever we get to them. Or the one that follows potentially the whole river right around to where. Correct, that, that, is, that isn't there. Um, it's kind of organically already there from people like myself that might go with walk, uh, but it's not a, a built trail. Okay. And Eric, I, I would ask, um, just while we're going through all this discussion, if could this be phased out further? So you've got phase one, four million, it, it, and you broke broke it out in increments. Could this logically be broken out? Absolutely. Into multiple phases. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Okay. Well, I see that we have our food <coughs> here. Um, if Seems like a good time to go and break and grab that and come back and kind of have a working dinner. Uh, again, just help yourself to, looks like we have enough to make two more sandwiches a person, so. Okay. Classically, about halfway through the meeting, Crystal cleared it all out, so. Right. <laughs>
Hey, you want to clear it all out? Bring two more sandwiches for uh, Mr. Renamire. No, 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 no. I'm good. <laughs> Ready? Yep. All right. So click through, click through, click through. So trail improvements to Miles' question. Um, you're right. Trails and connectivity are also very high near the top uh, in terms of what uh, our residents would like to see in the future. You know that we've wrestled with the connection, kind of what I'll call up on the hill, the Larimer County side, down to the Pooter Trail, down to the co <coughs> downtown corridor, those kind of things. That was the $5 million project, and that number is an old number. I'm sure it's quite high, quite a lot higher than that now. Um, but we recognize that we don't have $5 million or six or seven or whatever it might cost now. So we decided we kind of use the uh, baseball game analogy to score runs by getting a whole bunch of singles and try, instead of trying to hit one $5 million home run, we're gonna do a bunch of little projects and work towards the completion of that project. And also know that we have all these other connections that are coming that we're gonna to have to continue to work for in terms of funding. So when it comes to trail funding, there isn't a lot. We, you're right, Miles. We just did start to allow uh, part of the, the funds there um, for the park improvement fund, which is we're about nine months in, um, to go to trails. But we do have to balance within that funding the capacity of building out our park system, the community parks, and our trail connections. And right now, we don't have enough money to build it all. And I'll give you an example. I just got a text while we were sitting here, and the other folks were talking from Wade, um, who's at a conference. But he just learned today that the uh, Kiger Trail, which is not quite a mile, the low bid came in at $816,000. So if you think about it, bump it up to a mile, you're really talking about one mile of trail costs about a million dollars. So when you think about that in context of connectivity throughout all the neighborhoods and those kind of things, that potentially adds up to a lot of money. So funding source for trails itself is going to be some, something we're going to have to tackle in the future. And we're working on some decisions there to bring to you, in, you know, down the road. But for 2020, kind of those singles in order to lead up to the big home run, which is to connect uh, the top of the hill down into the Pooter Trail and to downtown corridor, is uh, three different projects. So this year, as I just mentioned with the bid we just got, um, so I should mention that 816, we we budgeted a million, so we're a little under the budget, and then hopefully we'll learn soon at the end of this month about a GoCo grant which would get us back an additional 200 or so thousand dollars. We're probably talking with the grant, you know, six, 700,000 what we would spend and not the million that we have budgeted this year. So in 2020, what we're proposing is completion of the number two connection, which is from the HH stands for high hops over to Kiger. Uh, we're in an eminent domain case right now, trying to uh, acquire the, the right of way there for that piece. A bridge on the west side of, uh, County Road 13, there to connect the trailhead, put a pedestrian bridge there beside the, the bridge on 13, but on the west side so we can uh, use Larimer County open space money um, to build that there. And then the, from the north side of the Poudre River on 13 up to the intersection at 392. So what that does is if you're at the trailhead, you now have a safe way to get over to Kiger and either go to the Poudre Trail that direction through River Bluffs or Take the number two all the way to um, Boardwalk Park if you'd like to. So it's, again, a bunch of singles <coughs> in order to accomplish the greater mission. Instead of sitting here going, we don't have $5 million, so we can't do it. Um, so questions on those three projects or any other trails? Yes, sorry, I just want to make sure I'm track and read. I see that slide. There's not, most of the other slides have prices attached to this. Sure, so I can tell you those. Um, the materials we got have Windsor Trail system at 1.4 million. Yeah, so the Pooter Trail at 220. So you'll see the you'll see the Pooter Trail one in the in the next slide. Okay. The 1.4 million is are these three added together. So this is 800,000. This is 300. This is 300. Gets you to 1.4. Last time you have to hear it. What is the plan? Like you say, five million dollars. I don't even know what that. Do we have a route? Do we have 
design? Do we have anything? It's just it's been out there for eight years under long-term project. So we're we're working on three different potential routes. One would be down County Road Five over to uh, Jacoby Road or 32, and coming that way. One potentially down through the uh, southern portion of Rain Dance or the golf course, cutting down that direction. And, the, and probably the most difficult one would be cutting through uh, the open space and private property that, that kind of is the, the western side of River West going up to the top of the hill there. But that involves a lot of landowners that are a little tougher to deal with. So we're, we're trying to figure out which is, which is the best way. We probably, my gut says, we probably end up doing both the County Road 5 connection and some kind of connection through Rain Dance. But I think what this does will, will allow people who can get to the trailhead a quicker access to downtown as opposed to going the Pooter Trail east all the way to Eastman Park and then taking 7th Street into downtown. This way, literally when they get to 392, they're almost to downtown. They could be to high hops much faster. And then the other connection, and I'm going to blank on this, someone to help me on the neighborhood. The neighborhood that Ian lives in is called Westwood, Westwood Village. In the uh, TMP, the connection from that neighborhood over to the Pooter Trail, which probably involves a bridge, actually was the number one trail connection that we found in the, from the public feedback. They, that neighborhood really spoke to connect there. So that's another piece that potentially comes, but not until we are the easement holder of Frank State, which we hope, hope happens late this year, early next, and then we can begin to involve the landowner to discuss that trail. So I get your frustration. <laughs> know that we're working on it in many levels in terms of what's next, in, like where, where we put a trail next, and then how do we fund it? And that's probably the bigger issue is how do we fund a trail when it costs a million dollars to build one mile. <clears throat> and I hope it's not the last time we hear from you about it. <clears throat> Go uh, probably won't be in next year's cabinet. No, yes, sir. Even if the miles uh, don't change the term of it, and it's not there, I think it's still important to a lot of us, for all of us, hopefully. Um, my question is on the bridge on the County Road 13. You said it's going to be on the wet blurmer side? Yes. Right? And the reason why there was purely financial to try to tap into those funds. Um, and then you're talking about the, the, the trail would then go from there north? It would go across 392. Correct. It would get to the 392 intersection. I think Omar mentioned earlier studying that intersection. I think that's critical. Um, we may not have perfect improvements to get you across. I think they'll be be safe, but maybe not great in the short term. But when they study that, I think we'll learn that 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 intersection needs some safety improvements in terms of you know some maybe some pedestrian islands that kind of thing. <coughs> Yes, sir. Eric, uh, anything in the budget for connection from the PQ Trail, the Windsor Lake Trail, along the number two? Is the developer going to take care of that? Or is that it? I is believe that, that is developer built, but let me check with Wade, and he's at the conference, and he's the expert when it comes to that. So I will, if you'll make a note, we'll, we'll, we'll check on that. Good question. Anything else on trails? On this part of the trails, there's another slide on trails. Okay, next one. So every year annually, I think this is the third year now, uh, we budget $75,000 for flood resiliency. This, if you remember, this portion here, um, kind of where you can see the, 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 the grass matting and the benching that took place, that was part of when the, when the trail collapsed a couple of years ago. Um, it ended up costing us 450, uh, not us, but three entities. $450,000, we got a grant, everybody chipped in, but the, the philosophy of the three entities, which was Weld County, Greeley, and Windsor, was, hey, we want to be more proactive than reactive, so let's set aside $75,000 annually that we, if we have a flood issue that we see is going to happen, maybe we can head it off and spend some money there to, to mitigate it before it floods. So that's the annual amount there. Keep that number in mind for the next slide after this, but then there's $20,000 for Pooter Trail work along the uh, east side of Water Valley going north and south on uh, uh, 
257. We've got some money in this year's budget to do some of the work, but the, the prices came back a little more, so we won't be able to complete it. So this is to complete that section of re trail replacement. So if you ride that portion of the Pooter Trail, the sidewalk heaves a lot, or the, the trail heaves a lot, because there's some large cottonwoods that back up against those homes and they've busted up the concrete. So it, it, it's a fix, uh, completion of a fix that we started working on this year to complete it next. Any questions on that? That parallels 257. That parallels 257 on the west side. Eventually, <coughs> yeah, you know, we have a safety issue there. Potentially, we've got to either do an underpass, an overpass, some kind of hawk system or another light, or what I would argue might be the best plan is to have, take the Pooter Trail and go to Eastman Park, drive at the intersection of 257, jump over to the other side, and when that uh, develops over there, and I think that might be Great Western, on the east side of 257 and run the trail there and basically eliminate this piece. But that's down the road when that section develops. Eliminate the crossing, you mean? Or move yeah, eliminate the crossing or, or move the crossing to the, to the major intersection to Eastman Park Drive. Yeah. That's a, uh, I'm going to put a river trail corridor board and it, I hear about it all the time. It's that, that crossing and what are we going to do? Mm -hmm. and, yeah, so you get potentially moved. You know, one thing that's come up besides you know, potentially moving it to Eastman Drive and, you know, if the uh, crossroads thing could also be an option, but that I think complicates it further because then you're over in Water Valley South. Correct. Kind of moves the entire trail. It would move the it would move the whole trail. Yes. So that could be a lot more possible. <coughs> Eric, before you go sure. forward, one I keep again trying to tie out what I'm seeing in slides that we have delivered to us. Mm -hmm. In other parks, there's two entries for a winter trail system. 800,000, 300,000, which equals 1.1 million. And you had said that the uh, three trail improvements are 1.4. I'm, I'm assuming, while the numbers don't drive, these two entries are these, are these three projects. Those two entries are, I need to, there's another 300 that's probably missing here. It's the bridge, right? This is the. <coughs> Yeah. And then the, the 7520 you just referenced, there's a Pooter Trail entry and it says 220,000. Which is, a, that's a typo. That number should be 95,000, <coughs> not 220. Okay, thank you. Yep. No wonder. <coughs> It's 220 because there's the 125 for the realignment. No, that, that, that 125 for realignment is actually in this next slide, but that is the 2223 transportation alternative grant that we received. That's the match. It should be in 22 and 23, not in 20. That's why I said it's a typo. Are we going to get revised after tonight? Like the, with the numbers yeah it, yeah absolutely what, again what it's just yeah. I mean we, we were meeting last week and revised numbers and these things go and you have them in you know these documents and your PowerPoint and I'm, I'm sorry for the confusion there's just a lot of places to miss them so we absolutely will update all these. so in the next slide remember the 75,000 but click through <coughs> Carl so assuming we don't have a flood next spring and we don't need to spend that 75,000, what I'd like to do is potentially consider using that money. This is the, resil the, the, the river easement acquisition piece um, to create a greenway, but also to move the trail in areas that we feel like need to be moved. This is the area right here. So what we would potentially do if we don't have flooding next year and don't need the 75,000 is use potentially that 75,000 to acquire easements to move the trail. And this is a little bit of hedging our bet, getting prepared for the 22-23 transportation alternative uh, uh, project with, that we already got the grant for, which is to move this section of the trail. This is where it collapsed right here. To move the trail, see what the, the, this red line is the current trail, and that's where like here it might collapse, is to acquire easements and move the trail, permanent ones move the trail a little farther away from the river so that we don't have to worry about a bad flood and losing the trail every single year like we sit there today 
next spring? Are we going to lose a portion of the trail or not? So if we don't, we'd like to use that money next year if we need to use it to acquire some easements in here to push the trail. I think this is part of a bigger effort of Weld County and Greeley. And, and Greeley probably has the most spots to fix. But basically <coughs> the thought is across the trails that you, you spend money now to save money later instead of repairing the trail every five or seven years. No Correct. Flood, you fix it now <coughs> and then it, it's more permanent. Correct. And it also creates a greenway, a larger buffer along the river corridor which I think you might recall, and I can bring it back in a future discussion, um, Wade has shown you the diff different distances from the river. If you protect that, it helps wildlife habitat. The farther away you go, it, it helps the birds and the deer and those kind of things. Yes. What are the lines? What's the yellow dot <coughs> versus the green? And Great question. That's Wade's slide. I don't know. I told him I'd win. The yellow dotted line, though, is not the alternative trail. Either. It's this white line. We try to we try to move. So the red line is the current trail. We try to move the trail away from the river because rivers will do this. They'll go in, they'll go out. So that's that's an area that we've targeted that we need to move move the trail. So any questions on that? That's one more comment. Some of us really to move their trails. They're having to move the trail to the other side of the river, mm -hmm. which uh, just adds so much more cost. It does. It. Bigger challenges than we do it on our end. <coughs> okay. Next one. Eaton House. So this, this building has been sitting there. You've seen it. Um, we have gotten a cost. Well, we, and I mentioned this in the past, but we'd like to spend about $300,000 and take off the two sides that were add-ons, which is here and kind of over here, get it down to its shell, um, and turn it into a business incubator, kind of a working, working museum per, per se. We don't need to build another, what I'll call static museum, where people walk in and see things, they can use them, but, but you know, it just basically sits there. So for example, maybe someone runs a, runs a business out of there, where they, they have a microbrewery somewhere else and they want to sell their wares there and see if people like their beer, or, cookies or cupcakes or whatever you want to do. We have a built-in audience at Boardwalk Park. It's a great spot. Um, we own it. It's been sitting there for quite a while. Uh, I can't remember the year 18 something it was built, but um, I met with a couple that lives across the street a couple of months ago. They've been in that house there, the, the, the one right, what's their name? Millers. The Millers. Um, they've been in the house for like 15 years and they've just watched the home, other than us doing some paint jobs or that kind of thing, continue to deteriorate. They also would love to see something happen there. We would love to renovate the site, uh, turn it into a business incubator, uh, into kind of a museum slash business facility. So, any questions on that? So the historical nature of that building does not include the annex? Or no, those annexes are add-ons. Add so you could take off this piece, this piece, maybe you throw a wraparound porch on it, mm -hmm. those kind of things. The restroom on the south side was also an add-on, the bathroom shower. Okay. Yeah. 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 I've actually gotten sides off to take the word. Yeah, we'd love to give you a tour. It is full of a lot of uh, storage, storage things that, as I mentioned on our tour, that we'll move out here. Once you remove all those annexes, is there enough space though to be viable for? I think something small. Yes, it's not going to be some, you know, you're not going to seat 50 to 100 people, but it would be something small that that you can test your wares. I think the theory there is, you know, if you rent it from us for a year at whatever the cost, and then you decide that you've got a legit business and you want to rent a place in downtown, we'll give you your rent back. If you decide to go move your business to Fort Collins, we'll keep your money. <laughs> what about potential business being out of the damages, the historical nature of the property? Good question. Um, probably a risk I'd be willing to take. I don't know that it's, it, it, it's, 
it's the struck the bones itself is what's historic about it. So, you know, I don't see anybody. There's probably not going to be like a commercial kitchen in there. I think it's it's probably something that people can maybe they make their stuff off site and they bring it in, they can heat it up or something like that. Or if it's beer, you make it off. You know, it's not gonna, if you have a microbrewery, you're testing maybe your home brewer. You're not going to be able to put your your whole brewery in this place, but you could sell it there and see whether people like your drink. Any more questions on Eaton House? All right, next. So we mentioned this uh, last year when we were doing the uh, kind of the roundabout in the parking that's in, in the uh, cemetery now today, and it's open. Um, and I think most of you all recognize that along 392 and 257 from the sidewalk to the road is an eyesore. There's not irrigation there. Uh, staff has done a much better job this year kind of cutting the weeds and keeping them down. But it's still brown. It doesn't, from the road looking to the cemetery, the cemetery is this lush, green, great, well manicured space. But from the road to the sidewalk, it's kind of so so. So this is about a $100,000 project that would improve basically from the arch all the way to the main entrance um, to the cemetery off of 257. So you want to click to the next slide. So these are just some artist renditions of what you would see. You'd see some plantings, a lot of native grasses, some low rock, low maintenance, but much higher, classier look than what's there today. So that's $100,000. Here, let me clarify one. So the, the project would actually start where the sidewalk ends traveling west where the open space is. It would start there and wrap all the way around to the entrance, roughly 17,000 square feet. Thank you. <clears throat> any questions on that one? Would any of it be uh, conflicting with the expansion of that intersection? You know, when East Point went in, they were they're talking about the future, you know, CDOT was talking about the future expansion of that intersection with any of the landscaping we're talking about as it gets close to that intersection, would any of that be damaged? Or I don't, I don't believe so. Uh, I remember when we, when some of that work was done, there's, I know Omar, you jump in if you remember this. I remember having conversations with Dennis that there's not much room to go towards the cemetery yeah, because you're going to be onto the graves. Right. So I, I, not being an engineer, I would say no. I just didn't know what it looked like in the corner there. Though. Yeah. It, it's super tight. There's not a whole, I mean, yeah, a foot or two maybe, but not much. <coughs> Chris looked into it. Yeah, the back, from the back of the curb, maybe 10 feet to our property line. Mm -hmm. 10, 15. Okay. So, good question. And, there's, and it's a pretty significant elevation drop from the road yeah. down to the cemetery. Well, I know CDOT had talked about doing a retaining wall right there. That if they had to expand, you know, that intersection and bring it out towards the cemetery, but because of some of those graves, they'd have to do some kind of retaining wall. So I just wanted to make sure we're not spending money to then several years from now or something have to undo it all because we're doing an expansion of the intersection. I think, I think make sure you edit that. Hopefully, that was me. <laughs> the majority of this landscaping is along Main Street. Okay. Wow. Oh, next slide. Before we get into this, I want to show you something to you. So Tara this last summer, or spring actually, met with Grandview Elementary with every grade, I think second through fifth. And she gave two through five? K. Oh, K through five. So this is one school, but it's a representative sample. She gave them all three dots and gave them a variety of things that we might have in our park system in the future, whether it's expanded or not. And so they put all these dots there. So you can see virtual gaming and esports, river access, free Wi. Who would have thought that a two to five year old, a K to five year old kid would have thought about free Wi Fi in their parks? They all like streamed and cheered. Indoor field house. Okay. Playgrounds, recreation sets, <laughs> community parks and neighborhood parks, swimming pools, trails and open space, 
Dog parks and ball fields. Rectangular sports fields. Sport courts. Splash pads in a senior center. <laughs> and the women. The women's on top. <laughs> so remember this as we go through this one. I know we talked about this last year. I won't spend a lot of time on this. But these are the people that are going to go, hey mom, hey dad, give me the 20 bucks I'm going to go play on. Think about all those dots and then look at that. So, the women. We talked about it last year. All for the women. So, look, it could have came out any other way. When we saw that, I was like, Make these, get these laminated. Get them laminated. We're going to save those docs. I'm surprised kindergartners knew what a senior center was. <laughs> I would have never. for the old people and wanted to make sure they had stuff to do. To they did. One of the ones that really shocked me was how would a kindergartner <coughs> to a fifth grade care that much about free Wi-Fi in a park? It blew I, me I away. I can tell you because the kids go to use your phone to get a game. And if there's bad Wi-Fi, you say, sorry, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm high on my dad. Yeah. So, that's why. <laughs> gotcha. So <laughs> the Wibbit, as you've seen before, is a, basically a water playground that we'd like to put on the lake. It isn't just an amenity. Think about this as a business model. Aquatics sits in the general fund. No matter where you go in this country, aquatics costs money to run. It's almost like owning a boat. But as you continue to grow in a community, you have to have outdoor pools, you have to have indoor pools. That's what people want. They want to swim, they want to play in the water, they want to cool off, they want splash parks. The Wibbit will allow us to generate revenue that we can use once we've paid off the initial investment to, to, to offset some of the costs that we are taking out of the general fund. So we've done a very conser super conservative effort this Wibbit doesn't exist in Colorado. The closest one is in Nebraska. There's mm -hmm. only 20 or so in the country. Um, so it would be the only one. People would come to Windsor Lake, spend a lot of time and money there, and we would be able to pay it off in four years. When we've talked to other operators, they think that, our, that we'll pay it off in two. But we could pay it off in four based on our numbers. With, that's an 11 week summer. Um, and then that rest of that money so the lifespan of this is 10 years, the rest, after we've paid it off, can help offset aquatic costs that we're seeing in our outdoor pool um, in, in terms of that. So any questions on the Wibbit? Explain the ongoing expenses of 57. So that's lifeguards mainly, annually. annually. This project alone? Mainly lifeguards. Um, we have installation of it in the spring every year and then takeout every year, not done by us, done by a professional team. Um, we'll probably have you know, a few, we're going to have to replace some things like life jackets, those things wear out. So that's that, we've kind of plugged in a replacement cost of things like that. And did you uh, account for security? Yes, thank you for that. I totally forgot about that. Is, that, is a, that was one of the concerns of the chief. And so it does include uh, a security company up until midnight every night. Go for it. Would the extra money after it's paid off take a chance? Would you say? So the engineers have a It theory. absolutely could. And the women was the only one that all the kids could reach, so they pair things up. <laughs> yeah, we need to go back to the how, how statistically valid was this survey? That's great. It, it, it could, to your question. It, for me, I recognize that we're always going to have an outdoor pool but it costs money to run. And so trying to come up with creative ways to generate revenue to offset some of those costs. And I think this will do that. <coughs> Any questions? So, so the board obviously heard about a little bit last year and determined that, that it, it didn't really uh, meet our needs last year. So, so I asked him whatever questions you have. And again, we can, um, we'll can we probably have a follow-up on everything in November, <coughs> kind of circle back on all this stuff. But if you guys have any questions or concerns, that was a great time to hit them with them. 
Well, it, I'm going to stick with my stance from last year. Um, it didn't resonate with me last year, and I, and I, I mean, I, I think it's great that kids want this thing, but I think what we're trying to build back there with the Eaton House and we got the historic museums, to me, then you have this big plastic thing. We've done a great job putting in the pavilion there to look architecturally nice. This detracts from what the vision is or was kind of back there with the historic park than to have this big plastic mold thing. And so I just don't think it, it, it fits back there and it would be a detraction from what is now a lot of folks call a gem. And we already are seeing some problems back there. We think this would be detract even more of the problems that we, when we have problems, those kinds of problems that we have. I'm open to it, but um, what I was going to point out at CML, I went to the uh, a session there where it had um, Colorado Springs was like the bigger city that presented about their program. And then they went down to some medium and small towns and some of the um, things that were successful, I can't remember who it was, but they had like a, they had a water feature in their town and they put a, I think it was like a zip line where it pulled people through like on a, like, like on a wakeboard that down across their lake. It's a private park, a public-private partnership. It's, on, um, it's down south somewhere. I can't remember off the top of my head. We can figure it out. I can look back on it. But um, but ultimately, they did have, it wasn't a women. It was a different feature in the water. There's this um, public-private partnership. But basically, people were paying money, and they could get it. It was like a ride that pulled them on some kind of zip line through, through the water kind of like surfing on a lake, so to speak. But they pitched it as like much more successful than they ever expected it to be. And so I, I think there are things like this that can work. We just have to make that decision if it does fit. Right. Who's the private security firm that patrols? It would probably be like a secure toss or a you can call them your You can call them your clients. Eric, this isn't even specifically to you. I guess it's a larger commentary, but I, I find myself with many of these projects looking back at the criteria in terms of priorities, one, two, three, four, in terms of limited dollars being spent on higher priority items. And if I look at the criteria of how they describe priority one, priority three, et cetera, at best I think I put this in three where it just says, offering an expanded service. Now the words in here don't say necessarily expanding revenue, <coughs> but you're saying that it would bring in some revenue. But I guess I'd ask Shane and, and each of the department heads to, to go back carefully and look at you know, the, the, the myriad of CapEx projects that we have here and make sure they line up with the priorities. I know you, I know you went through that exercise. Mm -hmm. It's clear that people labeled their materials as being Priority one, two, or three could do, should do, etc. Right. Um, but I'm not sure who then sorted them from the town view well, as a whole. Right. And again, when it comes to the capital stuff, I I try not to edit a whole lot. I think that I really look philosophically that the capital program is really the elected officials. This is you know a place where you guys really have a chance to say you know fight for trails that go up the road or, or whatever we're going to do. So I haven't really had a whole lot of it. I, I haven't really gone through and said this doesn't make it or this does, just because I, I, I don't want to scrub the capital to a point of where it's presented to the board and say, okay, there's no party you want, and you know, you're not really using your elected uh, responsibilities of saying, well, you know what, we want to fight for the women anyway because it's what the, should be in the park. So it's I, I really have leaned on the board more for that. I certainly can do that. I just again feel soft feel like that. That should fall <coughs> to the board. Okay. Uh, and, sorry, just you know, just looking at the summary, for instance, there's a parks and rec responsibility, CapEx eleven million, police fifty thousand. I don't know, in terms of priorities, I think we all think safety's pretty darn important. Mm -hmm. It just seems odd cheap that you got fifty thousand dollars CapEx and parks has eleven million. <laughs> so if no. I could comment on that. One. The 11, I hope, is really only seven because we're hoping that Diamond Valley 
we don't need to spend the money. Yeah. And the other is, as Dean said earlier, um, the park has some of the park improvement funds. Yes. We, ha we have yeah. our own dedicated yeah, funding source. So it, it's a difficult comparison. Well, and then uh, uh, another thing, like um, we also have like the equipment that goes into capital. Obviously, Chief gets equipment through their police cars, etc. <coughs> and um, we are going to do our requesting facility master plan for next year, which is going to kind of tell us to consider, do we do a new police st station? Do we do a substation? You know, we're going to need to acquire some land in there. So <clears> the <throat> bad news is the PD has some big numbers coming at you. Yeah. They're just not fully baked for, for 2020. But, but the thing we have to keep in mind with the parks, most of these requests, unlike engineering or planning, those are, or public works, those are projects to do something, whereas most of these projects we're seeing for parks, that's not where it ends because there's going to be continuous operation and maintenance costs that are figured in these numbers and probably a personnel ask as well because you can't build these additional facilities or things without hiring additional folks too. So that 11 million or that 7 million is, is truly, unlike some of these other things, they don't, they don't mean ongoing maintenance, of, maintenance and operating costs and hiring additional people. That is kind of the, I mean, when we get done with that project, we're done. Whereas when we're looking at these requests from Parks and Rec, there's a lot, there's additional ongoing costs almost with every single ask. And I, th I just think that's important to keep in mind. I, I think your, your, your point's very valid. You also, I think that's part of the reason why a year or two ago we went back and said, hey, we don't need to build a neighborhood park in every park, or in every neighborhood, because we, we can't keep up with the maintenance right. of it. And so why we consolidated it down to say, we're done with the exception of the five that we're on our, our, our kind of our party on the hook, and then the three that parks. Okay. Yes. Regarding the loop, what is the uh, negotiations with Bank of Colorado for sponsorship? So we are, we've talked to them, it hasn't panned out, uh, so that's a bold note okay. uh, about trying to get someone to sponsor the original investment, so that, or part of it, so that it wasn't as large as what you see on the screen, but it didn't pan out. Shane, I guess if I can ask you then, if, as, as I go through here and look at the priority definitions and mm -hmm. criteria, but inherently it's different if, if it's a self-funded program, like parks having the access to their own revenues. Right. I guess you'd have to almost say within their selection, how do these fit in terms of priority within their budget, within their fund? Mm -hmm. right? I mean, you can't compare. I, doubt, I imagine there's very few things in parks that would be cannot reasonably be postponed in order to avoid harmful or undesirable circumstances, right? Right, no. uh, yeah, right. I mean, meeting that criteria, I mean, it's like if you've got some parks, with, they hit a certain population uh, density in that neighborhood, and we say, okay, they met our threshold, and we've got angry parents calling us asking them to <coughs> build a park. So it's not a life safety thing, but we do have some things that are triggered that way. Mm -hmm. But you're right, like the, um, I think at Eastman, if it didn't happen next year, it just doesn't happen next year. There, there's, it's not exactly the same as widening the road or, or some other things that have a little bit more immediate impact. But at some point, isn't the park improvement fund going to like diminish? I mean, be completely. So yeah, it, it, at I mean, some, like, at some gonna, point, we're not when we're not building, we're not collecting that fund. Correct, and so and after we've made all those commitments. That fund isn't something that it will continue to replenish. And his right. ask won't be seven million dollars either. Years. Right. So what the ask in the future, and that's part of what will come out of the strategic plan, is the park improvement fund is used to build the assets the first time, and then down the road when they wear out. And you're right, we would have reached build out or at some point, and so we're not seeing the money that we're seeing come in. Then it becomes a general fund ask. So for example, um, the chimney park pool is pushing 30 years old. We're probably at some point, and we've done a great job in terms of maintenance, uh, making some, some major investments along the way to keep it up. But at some point, and I would guess if I had a crystal ball, that in the next 10 years, that pool needs replaced. That doesn't come <coughs> from the park improvement fund. 
that is a project that we would be standing here saying, hey, we need $7 million to replace the outdoor pool out of the general fund or some other you know, sales and use tax or something like that. That's, that's, that's the piece in the strategic plan that we're doing today, <coughs> right now, that we're trying to figure out how do you pay for replacement of things 25 years from now. So the money we have today is to build the system out to whatever our capacity is in terms of um, our population and what their needs are. But replacement, that's the $50 million question. <coughs> So in terms of this process, did I hear you say we're going to come back to this but not till November? Well, we have the entire month of October is operations budget. So we've got um, four meetings that will be set in October and where we have each department coming to the operational budget. And so November is probably the first time, unless the board wants to have a, a special I meeting. Mean, I mean, I would just say that maybe we should look at the calendars because this is all fresh in our mind today if we don't come back to this till november yeah. and what we're thinking that's a lot of time and we have all we have constant things coming at us with different numbers right. and, and i would suggest that we maybe try to find a time now, not too and i and i think this is something that the board should just meet with, with the town manager to discuss what we think about things maybe in general sure. i mean and maybe up until that time if there's additional questions they can be asked so we can get them asked by the appropriate party. <coughs> sure. i think yeah. there ought to be a time for the board to to discuss this amongst themselves um, prior to november but i think we'll have to look at our calendars to see right. and maybe just do a special or, meeting maybe some kind of yeah. special I just think November seems like so far away, and a lot of these details we might forget. Sure. Okay. Well, we can certainly do um, <coughs> a special meeting in, in early October. Just pick, uh, and so I'll have, um, we'll send out an email kind of uh, see the preference for the board on a Tuesday or Wednesday night, maybe Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, see what night of the week works for everybody. Okay. Here. Here. Yes, I'm sorry, one last question on the minute. It says community park fund is going to pay for this. Is that a stretch for uh, that fund? Mm, well, potentially. It is an asset in the park. So the next one is Jacoby Farm. So there's $10,000 there. Um, within a couple of weeks, if not this week, we'll actually own the property. So be handed over the keys. There is a lot of what I'll call mitigation. Parks has already gone in there uh, and mowed weeds. I have a picture of literally they run a mower in the weeds for this tall. Uh, you can barely see the cab uh, that they were in. Uh, so we're going to have to do something there. We need to winterize it, uh, winterize the home, uh, maybe do some security there, maybe fence it. Uh, I expect to see probably in the 21 budget some construction and development of that park recall last year it was there we did a master plan in 18 that the board adopted so we'll bring that back to you probably for 21 so this is just um, what's not on this site that you in this picture is over here is a is a red barn and then behind that barn is a, what I would call another farm but it is literally falling over if we got a really good wind it'd probably fall anyway so we probably need to knock that down remove some vehicles or whatever they might leave on the property and then we're also working with um, Ms. Babcock to go through uh, any of her um, kind of museum potential uh, items for her to donate to the town to, uh, in our collection. So that's what that project is. That's this one. <coughs> and then over here is Harmony Ridge Park. This is one of the neighborhood parks that we have left on our list to do. Uh, there's $100,000 in there to do the design of that park so that we can probably bring construction of that park to you in 21. That uh, subdivision is also building out pretty fast. So we want to do design in 20, construction in 21. And that money is already sitting there in the neighborhood park fund. Is it, is it right where the word park is? Yes, right there. So there's a roundabout here. Um, the park is three acres, kind of like a, a pie shape. And then there's a future elementary school right there. What's the other dotted line up there? Oh, yeah, yeah, the yeah, yeah, I think that's the raw subdivision. Oh, so yeah. so it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's not, it's not a part of, 
It's not part of Marmalade Ridge It's Doug Holt. It's the palatial estate. No, I don't know. Do you think they would have met the threshold? I think they're getting really close, yes. Uh, we, we typically are around 80. Um, you know, we, what we'll do is look at it through the end of next year. And as we get into this meeting, if they're pretty close or they're going to probably get to 80 in 21, we'll go ahead and Well, that's the um, project to the east? Those yes. So they, they won't get another park. They will not get another park. That, so Harmony Ridge is there, the Jacoby Farm. It's considered a neighborhood park. Um, and we have Fossil Creek um, over off of five that Doug mentioned with the one roundabout and Wayne Miller. And I'll tell you, but not to jump back to the web, but Wayne Miller Park, they've already come to us and want to have access to the water on the, to, of the, to the lake on the north side of the lake, that, that development up there. So water access in terms of what we saw in the strategic plan and what people want, they want more access or more activity on Windsor Lake in any water that we have. So like the river walk, water access, Windsor Lake water access. So th there's three remaining parks to build, not counting Harmony Ridge. Okay, any questions? Next. So community rec center, um, an RTU rooftop unit. This is the third of four years. So these are the these are the original four on the old building. We've already done two. This would be the third one, 75,000. Um, and then kitchen floor replacement. We made an omission. It's supposed to be in this year, the 19 budget. So it, it wasn't. So we'd like to do that project in 20. And then there are several projects in shutdown week that we'd like to do. Totals 41,000. <coughs> The one that I, and I'll ask Kendra to give me them, but off the top of my head, I know one of them is the baseboard in the evergreen room. Looks pretty bad, so we'd like to replace it and tell me what the other ones were. The entrances to both of the entry doors, they actually would need to recarpet that area. We did a portion of the caulking around the pools this year. Unfortunately, that disintegrated a lot faster than we had anticipated, so we'll have to continue on and do the edge of that pool area as well as some of the um, poles for the activity pool. And then um, I think the bigger one was benches inside the, the locker the rooms. Locker room. Those were all original build. So those are all from 2004. And, and they're not in great shape. So we want to replace those. And that all comes from the, the O&M maintenance fund that is there. OK, any questions on those? So for those of you that toured the maintenance facility, um, I'd mentioned that they have to pour, they're gonna put the rails in and pour another concrete lift for the, for the uh, storage there. We've also included a small portion um, to total build out for that uh, storage in kind of the storage compartments on the rail system is about 400,000. We have some of it in this year's budget, I think about 100, including the rails. So that's the project. We'd like to budget 85,000 for another phase of bringing in some more of the storage, but also go after a dollar grant and potentially do it all if we were awarded the grant. So uh, we would use the 85 as a match if we get the dollar grant. If we don't, we would just buy another portion, $85,000 worth of the storage compartments that sit on the rail. And so that's to store things like dresses, hats, spoons, those kind of things. It's from larger compartments to small stuff. How much would the dollar grant be worth? Um, probably about three hundred. Yeah, we we would the smallest grant you can get is seventy five twenty five. So we would just <coughs> take a look and, and um, talk to our dollar rep to see kind of where our number needed to be. Yeah. I bet eighty five should cover our portion. Right. And I, I think we would be a great <coughs> candidate for it. You know, I really do. I thought the, the DBA and the town were going to go after a dollar money. Well, we are. I, I don't mind milking that cow. Many times. We're going to. So there's opportunities. The, 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 there is. You can go in multiple times for multiple projects. There's there's no limit. Um, Was this something? So we just gave back some money. 
if we had this project, would this project have qualified for that dollar money that we just had to return? Or is it no, oh, no, no, we turned, no, we turned, activity bonds. yeah, we turned back private activity bonds, so that's not oh, okay. at all for this. Okay. So any questions on museum collections on the left-hand side? So on the right-hand side is the main park infrastructure. So it's, uh, we did a study late last year to kind of look at the infrastructure during Harvest Festival. We're having things like power outages, stuff doesn't work. That park's our oldest park. The infrastructure in the ground is very old. So it's $100,000 to replace things like electrical services, those kind of things. Um, you see the note up there, number of services in a park, and I forgot to add the number, but Tara was part of the study last year. How many? 11 different Excel Energy accounts in Main Park. In Main because Park. every time they added a light pole or every time we hired like Scott's Electric to come in and add a new panel or the new panels that go down the trail um, that are new 15 years ago. But every time that um, happened, Excel never put it on one account because they couldn't. So now we have 11 different accounts in Main Park alone. So that's that's what that is for is to come there and make it into one system to to lessen our need or eliminate our need to use things like generators and turtles and running extension cords all over the place uh, it, it really every year in parks checks rec checks but things like wine fest and harvest festival we're all going into it with our fingers crossed that the power works so you mentioned Harvest Fest, and this isn't really a way budget thing, and I don't know if it's coming, but I'd really like to see a, a recap or report of Harvest Fest in terms of how it, you know, numbers and all of that sure. this year. <coughs> so to your point. And what are you, like, I know you guys have maybe in time to read the review that if we could get like a report of that and, and what you're looking at in terms of future Pretty years tough. with that, if you're thinking of implementing any any right. changes with any changes. To that or okay. We will do that and to that note, um, Harvest Festival with probably most of our events as well are up in terms of their three years without coming back to the board. So we'll be working some kind of process with all of the, that list, that litany of people that you have funded in the past, three years ago, coming back and going, you know, what, whatever that process might look like, what would you like to fund Harvest Fest or Wine Fest or whomever it might be. A lot of those people's three years are up. So you'll see a lot of that coming. Any more questions on Main Park? So the next one's kind of a nasty topic. Um, the sewer department has had, and this is just really, quite honestly, it's a capacity issue and a little bit of education. Um, at Eastman Park, the sewer department has a year to date come out there six times already to clear these pumps that we currently have because people like to flush things like baby wipes and whatever else down toilets. And they plug, the, they plug up these pumps and then we end up, you know, it's soccer Saturday and what do we have to do? close the restroom, hurry up and call in an emergency uh, porta john Moms hate porta johns they're disgusting, they smell. And so what we'd like to do is spend about $70,000 to get a grinder pump in that would just chew that stuff up and keep on spitting it downstream, so to speak, in the sewer line. Uh, so any questions on that? I'm imagining you have signs up that say, you know, we, we, we can educate some of it's that, um, yeah, it, well, you're not, you're not going to catch people, I wouldn't think, um, but, 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 edu but education is part of it. Um, I will tell you though, when, when I was in North Carolina, we had a bunch of lift stations and I literally, I don't know how the person did it. I saw a softball in the lift station. It had to go through a toilet. I don't know how in the world they did it, but people put anything and everything down toilets. We added trash cans in each stall, yep. hoping like don't put your diaper in the toilet, maybe put it in the bucket. Yep. Yeah. So, so this is just put a pump in that will grind all that stuff up and keep it flowing. Yes, sir. They just have to be a cute article about this, right? Denver Post, I think, or otherwise, because they their grinders weren't grinding those. 
the mm -hmm. The rags. And, yeah. Yep. So I guess just before you spend the 70, see if you can get right. testimonial. We will do that. They were. Right? They were? Yeah. <laughs> Chewed up the softball like it wasn't even there. Yeah. <laughs> but it wouldn't hurt that diaper wipe or baby wipe or whatever. So any, any more questions on that one? Then we'll go to my last slides. So archery range, if you haven't been over to Kodak Trailhead, this is our new archery range. It is heavily used, and I'll give you an example. In July, we had over 5,000 people use the archery range. We put a trail counter there. So we had a trail counter at the trailhead, and then we have a trail counter farther to the east on the trail, and we were able to track the differences. 5,000 people visited this. Now, I will say, in July, if you're a hunter, <coughs> you're shooting your bow a lot, preparing for archery season that started at the end of August. So the peak season in the summer, this place gets a lot of use. Um, so we'd like to apply for a $100,000 grant with CPW. They have uh, grants out there up to 300000 for archery ranges and shooting ranges. We've already talked to CPW. We'd be a great candidate. So we'd like to apply for that. 33500 33, is the town's match. Um, it would do things like fencing, shelter, overflow, parking. And then you flip to the next slide, which is my last one. So this is kind of what you saw on the screen. We'd like to add 3D archery and, and some fencing. And the reason for fencing is we have people who are parking here. Even when archers tell them don't do it, they still walk their dog down the sidewalk, walk down here to let their dog into the river yet we're shooting bows and arrows. Well, we're shooting arrows. We're shooting shooting arrows. Bows. So, <laughs> yeah. so we want to fence this off, sign it, that kind of thing, because we, we do potentially have a safety issue with people that won't listen when we say, hey, I'm shooting here, don't, don't take your dog back there. So again, like to apply for a grant. If we don't get the grant, we would still spend that money on some improvements like fencing, more of the, the safety items. So any questions? Can you go back to the previous slide? Yeah. So the town's portion is 33.5. Yes. Assuming the ground for 100. Correct. And are we going to add more targets as well, Eric? Yeah, there's, 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 if you flip over, there's some more targets over here, probably 3D, like an elk or a bear or something. And then so making the 3D course in here, which would allow us to hold tournaments and those kind of things. And a big reason I pay, I've taken my sons out here quite a few times, and, and you'll just go out and wait because, you know, the kids aren't going to shoot at a huge yardage. They're right. pretty short, so you, you, we have a little backup. So it is highly popular if yep. you haven't been out there. And, and a lot of the trail users, when they go by, they say, oh man, I didn't know they brought it out here. Yep. At least I heard that a lot. So it's, it's been widely used. Yeah, the new location, so it was at Eastman Park, then it was at Diamond Valley. <laughs> and this should be its permanent home. <clears throat> and, and what about that parking lot? Is there any plan to expand that? So, yeah, so Curtis has got in this year's budget just to overlay that, mm -hmm. slurry, seal. slurry seal it. But yes, to, in the grant would be to expand the parking here. We could go this direction as well in the future, but there's a little bit of grade issue. There you got a question. Oh, good. I just said um, when you moved, did I get a lot of good feedback? Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, I think just having the river and the shade is just a lot more enjoyable. You know, Diamond Valley was just kind of like. Yeah, out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. That's it. Shower next time, but <laughs> just can we see if I can give you a little bit of Scott Ballstead planning, are you ready to move on? To 
looking nice yeah. now. Yeah, go ahead. So I guess this one is uh, just a placeholder that uh, Shane and Ian and I met with uh, a professor from CSU a couple of weeks ago. Um, asked him some questions. He's part of the team that's working with the city of Broomfield. He's also worked with Garfield County and tried to just pick his brain to see what options we have out there that we could uh, attempt to do some air quality monitoring and uh, partner possibly with CSU as the lab that um, would uh, take the air samples and let us know what, we're, what emissions we are capturing. So this placeholder would uh, probably result in an RFP, I'm thinking, with uh, uh, some assistance designing the program, establishing the protocols, and then, like I said, having CSU, uh, we would have to have CSU take the canisters. These are SUMA canisters, or what they're called, and they're about two to 400 bucks a piece. And CSU is working with Broomfield. I think they've got 19 monitoring stations. They put a few at each oil and gas pad and then a few others throughout the community in strategic lo locations. Um, well, and it's got what you see, so they're, they're two to 400 each for each time you get a sample? No, it's two to 400 dollars to buy a canister. Well, but I don't think we would buy them. I think that they said their lab cost when we talked to you. Professor I was Nate. thinking you purchased them through them. No, they're, they're, it, it's, it's, a, it's the, the sampling cost. So, so if Summa Canister has their vacuum seal, they can um, regulate how big the hole for the intake is. So they can regulate it to one week or two weeks. I think about two weeks is about as far as you can go. And then they've collected and tested them in their lab. Right. I think every time they do that, you pay two hundred dollars. I, I thought there was still an upfront four hundred dollars. So, so the I just want to say the two hundred fifty thousand. We were trying to pick a number that seemed like the board would be limited by the budget amount, but also not pick something that's so sky high that it limited other things. At one point, we talked about, gee, should it be a million dollars? Should we just give the board a big enough number like the transportation reserve? So you wouldn't be limited by the budget number when we got into the discussions. But after meeting with this professor and seeing, seeing really where the cost would line up, I, I felt a lot more comfortable that a quarter of a million dollars should be, you know, should not be a limiting number for the board. Um, the the sumo canister part isn't going to be where the big one-time expense comes out. It would be if you decided you wanted to do a couple of static monitors in town. Um, we wanted a mobile lab. I mean, there's some other things that... Yeah, I almost feel like a chicken and egg kind of thing where yeah. we're going to be talking about this potential or, you know, these options with the board at next Monday's work session. but. Um, after meeting with the CSU professor, he did kind of provide some options that would be a lot cheaper than, or potentially a lot cheaper than what the million plus that Broomfield and some of the other communities have proposed. Because if, before we even go down this path, I want to see from a testing community what they're actually even getting out of it. Mm -hmm. And is it even improving any? any worthwhile data right. or information or what kind right. of data. It, it, and you're right, like, uh, it seemed like, it, and I don't want to take this entire presentation for next week, but it seems like a lot of these um, static uh, monitors really aren't proving it. You know, he said that, but the <coughs> canisters are pretty error proof. It seems like it, and it's kind of the lowest technology that's out there. They just set them up and they, they strategically place them around. And I mean, they can filter out. They know if somebody went and ran their diesel engine right next to it, they can pick that up in the lab. So they're, they're, they're not, the, the limit to them is they're not immediate. So if some, a constituent you know, calls Dr. Jones and says, I smell something in the air, that Zuma canister isn't going to tell you if something's going on. But every time we pull it and we test it, we're going to know if this is really what was in the air. So we can track it long term. Um, yeah, they did say that you could use them for, if you got a complaint, you could run out there with one of these and have, and take a quick sample right at that time. But again, you'd have to ship it to the lab to find out what's in that sample. Um, 
So I guess this, this is the placeholder that we put in there subject to next week's conversation. Well, and even subject to further conversation, I just, right. you know, the board has said we want a number. Um, so I want you to understand that this is a small educated guess, but it's still, we don't really know until the board says this is what we want to do. We can't really put a number in here, but it seems like $250,000 should address a reasonable air quality monitoring program next year. Whatever the board decides that's going to ultimately look like. Any questions or hold or have the discussion next week when we'll, we'll try to put together some additional detailed information on the board. Um, the bus stop installations, so you're aware, you know, we're going to be starting up the bus service uh, beginning of the year with Greeley Evans Transit and the $75,000 placeholder would be to install infrastructure at the six uh, bus location stop locations Windsor's going to have six stop locations. it's three three locations but um you've got one on each side of the street i believe mm. oh yeah kind of inbound outbound so it's seventy five thousand for all three or yes all three. For all, no that's for, for all, all total for all yeah okay Good. um Scott, sorry. yeah yeah, Shane, I didn't give you a name of that guy that was... We're, we're, we're still in contact with him okay. to get a proposal. Um, one little wrinkle is that uh, with the uh, agreement for the Evans Transit, right now it states that all advertising revenue generated from bus stops goes to the city of Greeley. We're trying to work on that provision. Yeah, uh, Ian has the draft IGA that Greeley has yeah. given us. and. We pointed that language out that obviously we wouldn't want to leave that language in if we had a situation where we were able to work with somebody and partner on a, a advertising. Yeah, but we are still working on a to get a proposal from him as well. So we've got this budget request that we're we're still working through that as well. The gentleman does outdoor advertising, so that uh, if you come along I-25, there's the big uh, electric billboard kind of thing. But he also owns a lot of in town, town entry signs, you know, party tonight, whatever, whatever. But obviously he's reserving the right to put advertising. Well, he said, I'll put those signs up for you. Or if you need bus stops, I'll erect those for you. But I want some right to put in advertising. And then you'd have to work out who controls the advertising, but yeah, it may so be an we're, option to- we're, we're, we're still working with him, yeah. trying try to get something together. But right now we don't have the deal, and right now, all yep. that advertising money goes to Yeah, that makes no sense. So we've got the placeholder right now, so one way or another, we are going to okay. need to build those. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> and then the transportation master plan quick win projects. Shane, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the concept here was um, we're going through the transportation master plan process this year with the plan to adopt it in the first couple of months of 2020. And so rather than having the town board wait until next year's budget process to try and implement any of these quick wins that might come out of the TMP, we wanted to bring some options for the town board to consider. Um, so these are the six that you'll recall the, the uh, transportation master plan consultant presented a month or so ago. And so we've just plugged in <coughs> the same numbers from that conversation. We did try to keep the, to keep them quick wins. Uh, we tried to limit those to $150,000 each. But as we got into vetting of some of those projects, obviously they grow when you need to acquire right of way or other things that uh, weren't accounted for in the consultant's quick win uh, budget. Right, well, and a part of that, these guys, we, we try to address um, pedestrians and people on bikes mm -hmm. and um, road traffic and so we try to address all the different needs in Windsor it just you just can't fit them all under that 150 umbrella right so these are in order of uh, ones that are obviously the quick wins the first one's the multi multi-use path north of King Supers I guess 
I'm not sure what order those slides are in. I probably have them backwards. Yeah, this one. So north of King Supers, this would just connect, uh, complete the connection from Cold Creek Drive up to the path that's along the Greeley Number Two. There's already a lot of foot traffic there, and I think that's a, a no-brainer. And Curtis has already indicated that he can um, <coughs> incorporate that into the uh, concrete. concrete replacement and repair. Uh, the uh, second one is the Hawk signal that was, uh, or the pedestrian crossing guidelines review of River Place Drive. Um, so this is where we t earlier discussed the possibility of a Hawk signal. Um, so that one's 100. Study and design, 25,000. Construction, 100,000. What's the RRP? Uh, uh, that's a flashing weekend. Right. So that's what we standardly put in. So, but that's not reflecting, if you could go back. So yeah, so I haven't been in the most recent conversations about a potential hot <coughs> signal or is that the, because otherwise if it's an RFB, it would be a smaller number than that, right? Right, and I think, but isn't this place in Jennifer where we're lacking electricity? Are we, probably uh, the the electricity goes right there. Well, an RFB can be uh, solar, but I think it's, it's more a placeholder in case we do go with the Hawk system. Okay. It's going to be, the, the study and the design is going to vet that out, whether, which, which one we go with. Can I just remind everybody, when I was the president of the HOA for Cooter Heights, that path that's on the east side of 17 right there, maybe Scott can point at it. Which one? Right east there. East yeah, perfect. Oh, perfect. And then where it continues over on the west side right there, which was on HOA property, that was a safe routes to school grant to put that in. Right. And that's anything but a safe route to school right there at that intersection. It's been highly concerning, not just from people in our neighborhood, but people from Water Valley South, you know, try to connect right. uh, to the Cooter Trail via that way uh, as well. And it's pretty dangerous, especially where our you know, before we had roundabouts on both ends of seven, the way we have it now, I mean, people are going a little yeah, over 45 well, miles. And there's no break in traffic. No. You know, that's a good thing about the thing where we actually stagger the traffic. Yep. And when you have the roundabout, it's a constant flow. So, um, and I don't know if you all fall, I mean, it's going to get a treatment. That the question is, because it's right next to River Place, and so, the, and again, engineers jump in, but it's, it's basically not a good practice to put a hot signal there because they're afraid that it's just for the drivers on the river place, you know, pedestrians can hit that at any point. It may become a little bit more confusing for them. So we're, that's why we're going to kind of go through the study and say, you know, we don't want to create more problems by addressing the safety issue. Um, so we're going to go through that, but it'll get yeah, one or the other. For sure, it's, it's absolutely an intersection that warrants. I just was reminding everybody that both of those paths, you know, Martin gave the right of way to that path on the east side, our HOA gave the <coughs> right of way to the path on the west side of seven, but it was all safe routes to school money that actually built that, is what I'm getting at. And it, it's not a thoroughly safe route to school, is what I mean right, right there. So, right. but whatever happens there. Will probably also impact the left turning vehicle right. traffic. Right. And so it's a, a challenging intersection. Yep. <laughs> what is RRFB versus it, Hawk? It's a rapid, 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 rapid rectangular. rectangular flashing beacon. So it's uh, when you hit the light and it flashes. But that, they're, they're on the side of the road then. Like they are. Yeah. And then what's Hawk? It's a, so, right, if you drive down. In Greeley and 20th Street, uh, just east of 83rd, they just put a new Hawk system in. Uh, it's just essentially an overhead right. look, yeah. Yeah. Uh, looking. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, Harmony uh, or Horse Booth. One of those centers look like right a train across. That's what I wish we had on 257 by Porter Trail. I think that's. See, I will never let it go in. I ask them. Can you see, you can't. So, no, they said you can't do that when the speed limit's 65. Well, then let's make it 45. Yeah. Yeah. Let's what, what, what do you remind me of all these quick more projects? 
What does that Can we go back to yeah. that first slide? Did you guys have that total? I know we had that somewhere for all the quick wins. But I don't remember. Was it yeah. So some of these are broken into phases, but if you just did the first mm -hmm. phase. Yeah, but do you remember just, I just, they estimated total for these projects. Okay. Yeah, when we first discussed it, we discussed it as a total. I, don't, I just have to. Yeah, that's even more. Yeah. Looks like just a little over a million bucks. For phase one. Right, for phase one. But is it, is it total? Wasn't it like 3.3 million something? Yeah, if you, if you, yeah, if you build them all, then you're adding another million dollars here. And, 550,000 there. one was touched on earlier with uh, Omar's uh, discussion about studying all of the different projects that are at this um, intersection. The study design, $25,000, and then the, the construction cost of two seventy five dollars was assuming that we wouldn't have to acquire any additional right-of-way. It's doubtful that that would squeeze into that right-of-way, so the $300,000 to address left hand, north and southbound, probably wouldn't cover the actual improvement. We probably have to acquire some additional right of way. So, but we do have the opportunity to with the property on the west side that that is coming to town ownership. So there is opportunity to actually fit everything in. Sure. So, so we don't we don't know, but that um, whenever the city finishes transferring the park to us. Um, I think we've asked for correct. So, so we don't actually own it. We only we would be the easement holder. But the state part of the hang up and delay is the state is negotiating on our behalf with the landowner that when they turn it over, that we can have the ability to put the trail and any right away on that kind of southern southwestern quadrant. So that that property is actually part of the Frank State. Any questions about that one? Okay. Walnut Street Bikeway is another one that uh, just the phase one study and design would be $75,000. That would be creating a bikeway from essentially 1st Street all the way over to 15th. Um, at some point where Walnut Street deflects to the south, they would uh, identify the most appropriate route to get to 15th Street and still stay parallel or fairly close to Highway 392. And then the uh, actual implementation then would be a phase two of $550,000. So the reason we, we, one of the reasons we looked at this one now is because engineering does have segments of Walnut that are planned for other improvements. And we could probably, we could do some of the restriping and those types of things in parts of the corridor next year, but then the implementation through the west end is a little more complicated and where the cost comes in. Is that? Yeah. You have this complete in 2020, but here it says phase two on your quick win. Okay, so that's probably one that got broken out into phases after the original number went out because we, it, once we saw that it was going to, not going to be able to be squeezed into the $150,000, that number changed. Okay. So that's what, why the difference there. So you think the construction and contingency would be 
Now the so the the design phase one would be the seventy five thousand and the five fifty five hundred fifty thousand dollars is the phase two. Right, twenty twenty one. Right. Okay. If the board wanted to budget for twenty twenty one. Anything more on that one? Can I ask, what's the history of this project? Where, where is this? So one of the, I guess during all the TMP outreach, the obviously Highway 392 isn't a very bike friendly corridor, particularly through downtown. Um, we did get a lot of feedback about uh, multimodal projects in the downtown area because it's difficult uh, to cross or to bike on Main Street and to get through downtown. So this is an alternative, a parallel alternative to downtown. Well, and, and Scott, I do want to clarify, we do have in the 2020 budget request all $625,000 is shown under 2020 right now. So okay. I, I don't know if there is any intent to move the capital to 2021, but it's right now it's a Yeah, the, the intent is shown here. We wanted to break it into phases so that way we're not um, otherwise it's not a quick quick win I guess to budget the 625 up front so. and, and we can't do it as part of this at, at a really low cost um, we're going to overlay and restripe the section of Walnut next year and it's wide enough in the section that we could actually just stripe in bike lanes anyway so it's really zero cost to the town it gets to be expensive as we moved to the west, right. but, but at least for part of downtown, we can do this at no cost next year. Yeah, I think that was first to fourth street or something like that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that's it. We did have quite a few people at our outreach events at the concerts in the park and that kind of thing that wanted to see more uh, bike connectivity down in the downtown area. And what's nice about Walnut is because it's um, one block off 392, it gives people off the highway, gives them, uh, you know, when we talk to the uh, traffic engineers, they talk in terms of, um, you know, if you're a pro racer, you'll ride your bike anywhere. If you're fairly accomplished, you double the next step down. And then the next step is, you know, you have your eight year old on their bike behind you. And that's kind of the comfort level we're looking for with a lot of these bike paths. Let's kids to ride on, people feel comfortable doing that. And so that's what Walnut Street really with, we're trying to get to is give people a nice east-west place to ride a bike to be pedestrians um, that's not on 392. So that, that's what the idea is. But don't we have the Pooter Trail along, and along the number two ditch? Um, I mean, it's, it's on the north side, but. but I, mean, I, don't, I mean, don't we have that kind of con connectivity? No, I think that's. The theory also behind this is to build out that internal connectivity. So you're right, there is a number two to the north, mm -hmm. the boot trail to the south, going, both going east and west. But there's not a lot of connectivity between the two to get into the core pieces of downtown to, at that comfort level of what Shane was just describing. So this is a stretch, uh, potentially 7th Street is a stretch that we would, over time, build that trail system out, whether that's on-road or off-road, to connect those two major corridors, the number two, or not corridors, but the trails, the number two, the footer. So it's about all the interconnectivity throughout the town. I guess my concern is I'm looking at this going, you know, when you get to Bank of Colorado, Walnut starts to go and it's like, so how, what, how I'm trying to envision where through private going? businesses and a private, you know, the, that shopping center where Senor Jalapeno is and things like that how this continues to go in a westerly direction. From yeah, and that's, that's where I was saying the, the study is what would identify the most appropriate connection. And it may be bringing the trail back up to Main Street and improving uh, a separated trail that connects into the trail that's in front of Safeway and further to the west. Um, yeah, that, that's exactly what we talked about, Paul, yeah. is that you can't, I don't think driving people through that court where senior jalapenos is enjoyable for anybody. So probably moving them north and then 
if we have, like, just say on the north side of the highway, instead of having a four or six foot sidewalk there, maybe that comes a 10 foot path, 12 foot path. Along 392 That's or right. so. I mean, but just giving people then it'd still be a great separated path where we're comfortable doing it. Well, I because I, I kind of recall the board looking at this like 10 years ago about creating bike corridors throughout the town, and, and for whatever reason, we determined not to do it. Oh. Well, that was before you. I think it's a great idea. Yeah. So, I mean, we have all these new restaurants. Remember, I can't remember what the, why they decided. We looked at it like all over. Well, and I would agree, Walnut's extra wide. I mean, the, the mill yeah. and new restaurants potentially on fourth. I mean, this will get people off their bikes off uh, of Maine and give them a safe way to up and down through those neighborhoods still and, and still access the shops and businesses on Main Street. Well, I would say one of the most dangerous intersections along Walnut is at Seven. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for anybody trying to just go across on Walnut right here, so. Mm -hmm. Well, people know it's a faster route than staying on Main in some cases. Mm -hmm. In many cases. Yeah. And then the multimodal safety improvements at Seventh and Main. Uh, these would probably require additional right of way as well. Um, but the design was the $50,000 cost, the construction was $275,000. Um, this would probably eliminate or replace the interim uh, improvements that are there. And the, the thought is this is a very heavily traveled uh, for kids going to the middle school and uh, intersection isn't very pedestrian friendly right now. So. I have the same issue with the budget reflecting the full 325 in 2020. Well, you we'll just split it out. We'll tell you the yeah, I think the, these last three projects that we're talking about, we split them into a phase one and a phase two yeah. because they did exceed that 150,000. So that's why they're Reflected that way. So, can I ask about the last project we were just talking about, the Walnut Street project, mm -hmm. and this one? Are we we're budgeting, or we're talking about budgeting for the, the engineering or the planning of it, you know, the study of it right. next year, but then keeping a placeholder, if you will, in the budget for the project? Should we? on the fly say, hey, we like the results of the study, let's go ahead and do it and implement it because we've already got the money budgeted for this year. My point is, what if the study comes back and we go, I mean, obviously we don't have to do it, but I mean, if, if us, on this project or the next one, if the study comes back and it says, and, and the board says, you know, based upon the results of the study, we don't want to go forward with it, et cetera, obviously we've already budgeted it, so therefore we could do it, but if we don't, we don't have to, obviously, or, fully implement it. I mean, I'm just trying to talk this through, you know, because sure. like he's saying, I mean, all of it's being budgeted in there, which is probably the safe, you know, safer way to go than, well, you know, to just study it one year and then. And this is the one that also could tap into your resurfacing and repayment. Right. So the project would almost kind of almost be done. Right. Well, I think we could do that regardless, though. We know it's wide enough to accommodate that. So that would be, I mean, it's just, piece of cake that's yeah. done regardless. I don't think anybody's arguing against the concept of having it. Mm -hmm. It's just what happens as we continue to move to the west. Um, but it, I think all these are, I mean, you got a good point, Paul. But, but we do have it reflected, I mean, in, in everything I'm looking at, Scott, this mm -hmm. entire budget is actually in the request that we've got. Right. I, You're going to be busy. Yeah. Um, He's going to be buying a lot of cupcakes for the engineering team. That's what he's going to do. <laughs> I guess my point is we, we don't have the study to know whether or not we want to do the project or what the scope of the whole project would be because we don't know what, it, you know, if it's going to be widening the sidewalk along 392 in a section or if it's going to be ending the project at 10th Street or something like that because the, the walnut seems to go south. So. That's what I don't know. I'm just thinking this out loud. Going, you know, are we 
budgeting the whole thing in so that we have it as an option where we can still do it. You know, kind of like the road out here in front of the public works facility. You know, it was a, hey, we've already got it blocked. Does the board just want to go ahead and spend 100 grand and get, you know, that whole section blacktop while we already had, you know, uh, 15 closed? I mean, that, that's what I mean as a line of Right, so I, I would just say, I guess the, the, if the board looks at each one of these individually and says, yeah, we think that Walnut Street is worth looking at or not, if you think it's worth looking at, it may make sense to also include some capital money in there as well. If you look at a project and it doesn't even meet that metric for you, if for whatever reason you say, geez, I don't think seven and 392 is a priority, then I think that we should just scrape it. But I think it's worth spending 50000 to study it. It's worth really considering putting some capital money in there as well. I agree. I'm, I'm er we're er er erroring on the side of we study it, we want to do it, this is what it's going to cost. Well, that was kind of the, the theory behind the quick win projects was to be able to Because it quickly can be studied and done in one year. Right. If the board wanted to. Yeah. Okay. And if we don't do it, we can get it with it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and then the 7th Street multi multi corridor improvements. This is probably, this is obviously the biggest one. Um, this phase one would be the study and 100% design. And phase two construction would be the million dollars. So if you'll remember uh, when we spoke about when the consultant was presenting it uh, earlier this year or a, couple, or a month ago, you know, this would be looking at pedestrian improvements, probably bike lanes, maybe restricting some parking and things on 7th Street to just make 7th Street much more pedestrian and multimodal corridor. And we and they, we do have the width on 7th Street for those improvements. It wouldn't be one that requires additional <coughs> right of way. And except for this kind of to, to, to Paul's point earlier, I mean, I think this project on 7th Street, if you really study this whole corridor, mm -hmm. that's going to probably take a good amount of time anyway, right? right. I, I don't know if it would be that feasible for you both next year anyway. Right. No, I think the study is the main thing, and that's, you know, one of, obviously one of our main materials in, in town. Um, and then planning level, of the construction is another thing that would probably be implemented in phases as well. But getting the study done. Yet, yet I feel like this is probably one of the more important because that, that whole corridor mm -hmm. is really really kind of dangerous in many spots. The crossing at Stone Mountain, that garden, that hemlock, mm -hmm. <coughs> right by schools on both sides. Yeah, I it's, think if you, I had this conversation with um, Miles last week, just if you go and just stand on 7th Street and watch, there's a constant flow of traffic in both directions at all times. Yeah. I mean, it just it doesn't stop. I, I went out on Garden the other day, you know, thinking that I was going to go south on Garden, and I sat there for quite a while. It was, yeah, so it, it is important. I, I just think that the study is extremely important to take a look at it. I just think practically speaking, it's going to be kind of like the kind of 5 and 392, that by the time we get to the study and do all the engineering work, I don't know that we'd actually have time to implement something next year. And I also think that $1 million is a pretty wild guess right now on what that would be. You know, so I, I, we could budget for some capital. I just think that it's, practically speaking, it's going to be hard to get it done next year. Well, I just think at least focusing on those crosswalks, even if it's not a long-term million dollar project, uh, those are, when kids are walking back and forth from STEM, you know, over to the other elementary schools. It, it, on all that traffic, it's tough. Because it's right now painted crosswalk. The kids stand on the corner and flips a coin if the cars are going to stop. We've had kids get hit at Hemlock and so a couple years ago. Yeah. yeah. So I, the bikes get forced off the sidewalk, so there's overgrown stuff. There's it's a narrow sidewalk that are close to the fences. There's just spots where I think the bikes get pushed into the road. I've gotten passed on 7th Street. I'll speed up. Now. There's cars that'll you know wait you know and here it comes so I've I've had it happen before where the road's wide enough that people have tried it. That, that's why I just think this is a priority for this area. And mm -hmm. 
but we can certainly focus on the safety on the crosswalks would be great. So I'd, I'd ask, not knowing, have they introduced, have you guys ever done any assessments for RFPs on 7? Have you ever looked at that? Obviously, volume no. counts. No. Traffic no. counts doesn't meet this one. Yeah, we, uh, yeah, they'd be vehicular volume traffic counts. Pedestrian counts, I'd venture to say as well. That's only 18 per hour. So, but we haven't actually studied any intersection. Okay. You guys can kind of make that note to take a look at a couple of these. Can we, can we I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to belabor the point, but at, at least there's one intersection because there's a left turn lane, right? You're coming south. The cars are stacked up waiting to turn left. Northbound traffic is preventing them from doing that. But there's another lane coming southbound. And if you're coming southbound, then there's a kid. And this happened. I, I saw a kid on a bike standing on the corner, so I stopped. The car was turning left was stopped. There was a line of traffic car coming southbound, couldn't see past the yeah. cars. The kid's walking his bike and I, the woman looks, facing me, looks in her rearview mirror and sees his car flying through. Sees the kid walking on his, his bike across the street. And honest to God, it was seconds. He, he just made it across as the car zoomed by at 40. So I, it's really dangerous. I think we just like to have us focus on those and whether the data suggests it warrants well, I, I think so. I, I don't know how it would, David. I mean, traffic counts are in seventh would be yeah, in any quarter hour of the day, and the pedestrian isn't really that high of a threshold. And given the, the proximity of schools, I would think it would meet that. I just don't think we actually looked at that through the engineering yeah. lens. But but I've already, you know. So is that yeah, why it, you, yeah, okay. when we already know we have a troubled area, why we have to do a, have to go through the even a study to determine what the fixes would be dependent on well, what this, the counts well, are going to show. This is a much I mean, we obviously know that we've got problems. We know right. we actually could probably pinpoint where some of those intersections are. So how much more does the, what does the study prove or give us that we don't already have so that we just could say, let's get going on <coughs> to David's point and get something done? This is a much ho more holistic study than just looking at whether or not one intersection qualifies for RRFBs. This is going to look at pedestrian and bike improvements throughout this entire corridor, as well as all of those intersections. So I think in the interim, we could do the RRFB study at 7th and Garden. When we say study, I mean it's staff. It's, it's, it's staff. It's right. taking, so, it, it's an hour of time internally or so. Yeah, in, in the, the flow chart that we look at for pedestrian crossing improvements, there, you know, there's varying treatments from signage to the RFBs to <coughs> uh, pedestrian refuges, concrete, state concrete in the middle. I mean, there's steps to, to take, but yeah, you're right. When there's obvious concerns, you know, it could be addressed fairly easily. And, yep. and we'll be we'll be extending the sidewalk along 7th Street from Hemlock towards the roundabout next next year, which will help there at the, the Hemlock intersection. It'll take that those people instead of crossing at Hemlock to get to the park, they're going to go down to the roundabout, which which is a lot safer place to cross. Underneath the cottonwoods, so those, those are yeah. on the east side right there. Yep. Those cottonwoods are probably coming out. They're almost everyone yeah. dying. Yeah, I think Hemlock and Garden and Stone Mountain all in a row. I almost wish there was only one, like Garden, mm -hmm. and it was lit. And somehow you said, you don't cross at Hemlock, don't you know, go over to this lit crosswalk. Which, mm -hmm. Anyway, I appreciate you guys looking at it, because that's a, that, that place scares me. Well, we have a lot of options given how wide it is, similar to Walnut, you know, on bike lanes or median or, I mean, obviously that screws up the parade. Um, I mean, median right now in the middle. Well, as we put, um, as we designate um, biking, it's probably get the vehicles off of 7th Street altogether for parking and look at other improvements. We can also kind of narrow those lanes and slow traffic down. So we can. I, I you're not going to be able to eliminate parking completely because there are some homes that face that way. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, once you get, yeah, like, once you get north of Elm. It becomes a lot. There, well, actually, there's some south of Elm. Chestnut North, yeah, there's houses that face it from Chestnut South. Yeah. There's none. Yeah. And most of those people that park 
in that zone live in those apartment buildings that there's already provided yeah. parking for? That, they, there they have, but there are some residentials as you go north there that I don't know what we're going to do. Right. Some of those folks do use, do need to utilize that. Right, and I think that's going to be part of the study that's they're looking the at. What are our options given our existing constraints? Okay. Sorry, got a sidetrack, but. Jeez. Okay. <laughs> You're done. <laughs> 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 This should be really quick. I was going to say $50,000. Uh, <laughs> what we're looking at is doing some remodeling at the, at the police department. Uh, we need to uh, reconfigure some of the control, uh, well, the current control work area where we have our officers. We only have like uh, seven desks there. We need to create more work area. Uh, and then we also need to uh, redo the administrative office area. Uh, we are currently have some of our light duty people working in that area, and we are uh, out of room. Actually, considering uh, moving my office to one of the closets and taking over something there because we are out of room uh, for people. So, um, Shane alluded to earlier that we're uh, looking at a substation in the future that'll be part of the uh, facility master plans project as to what's our best option. Um, the original concept of that building when we built it was supposed to last. When did we build that? 2010. 2009, 10. Yeah. So it's, it's, it was originally uh, designed to last 25 years. Uh, some of the th features we put in there with uh, uh, underground heat and uh, works great, but it's take up space we can't use, we can't do model on, um, we can't go vertical. Uh, we need parking space. If I take in Eric's parking, he's going to, we're going to have a war. <laughs> So uh, we, we just have some uh, uh, built-in constraints we need to look at. For, uh, and so uh, it, this here is just a, a stock gap to get us uh, a, few, a few more days in the building, uh, hopefully a few years, uh, to, to make things work. So, Are you adding walls? What is it that you're doing? Actually taking, actually no, uh, taking the, in the patrol, patrol room, we have that big, huge desk that was built in. Um, we're going to have to take part of that out uh, and put some work areas in there. And then the front administrative area, we're going to remove some of the, the cabinets and file systems back to our uh, record storage area and create some workspace in there. So. Questions? Good. <coughs> I'll tell you what, in about two years, I want to hear that quote. <laughs> I've got a $15 million substation and I need to be ranked. For, for the sake of time, we can just say yes to all of mine and we'll move on. Next slide. Um, as you can see here, we're going to do a town hall remodel and security upgrades. Um, this is all part of, uh, as the people move out and move out here, we're going to take a look at town hall um, for a lot of different reasons, but um, mostly for security and then better use of the, of the facility itself. So that's what we have. So we have met the with the uh, architect that's out here, uh, Randall. He's gone through four by four. He actually met with our uh, the team that's doing our security assessment, and so he understands exactly what that program is. Um, and then they brought out um, a couple of the FCI guys, and they went four by four. We met and looked, and so that five hundred thousand looks like a round number, but that's very close to that's when we got it was four seventy eight or something. And I'm not an engineer enough to use that number, so I just made a five hundred. Yeah, we yeah. brought it up a little bit. Uh, but this would um, take our, our basement, uh, move some of our common space, like the um, break room, and put our meeting room, bring that downstairs. We don't really need great windows or views. Uh, reprogram that first floor, um, so bring some offices down to the first part where we have the break room and the coffee room. Um, on the second floor, uh, around planning, maybe knock the wall down, uh, make some better space up there. So we got kind of a four by four plan to go through and just make that building by ourselves a few more years of usability out of that um, with the limited space that we have and really taking that, the, the, the basement that is completely unused for anything right now other than storage 
uh, some of that storage is going to come out here, and then we're going to try to reprogram that so we get some more life out of the building. Can we talk more about the security upgrades at Town Hall? Because that's well, a concern for look, there's a couple different things we're going to do. Right now, when you get on the elevator, you can take the stairs and get up to any floor, or get off the elevator, and go where you want to go uh, because of the stairs. We're going to try to block that off so people can just get in the elevator and go up, but they can't get off at each floor and roam around. That's going to be one upgrade. I, I'm sure some others are going to be to have some grates and stuff on the basement windows so you can't break a window and get you know get into town hall. Right, um, and so a lot of it is just going to be um, really some more walls in there. Paul, uh, right now you can, if you go down into the basement and you go around and you can get into any secure area, so I've, everybody's got a fob. There's no room at town hall you can't get into by just looking under there. So um, we're, we're going to make, um, right now we have our main entrance at town hall and then to the uh, east we have kind of the alternate entrance. That's gonna become our main entrance. That's where the public will come through. Um, we'll have some restrictions, some walls, some doors to, to where they can't just go and walk or all around without getting buzzed in by having somebody meet them. And so every, like Terry said, every every floor and center <coughs> being able to walk in from um, the park side and be able to walk right in, you'll have a, a, a wall that stops you there. You'll be able to talk to the cashier and get buzzed through. And as you go floor to floor, you just won't have unfettered access. So that that's most of it. It's not super fancy. It's just where'd you uh, say the main entrance is going to be on the east side? Yes, the northeast. Yeah, the northeast. It, 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 instead of right now, it's an employee entrance. So, uh, like so, from the Walnut Street side, um, right now the main entrance is on the northwest side. It'll be on the northeast, so they'll be able to come in. We'll have community development. And the, they'll have to all come through the front, no back door. Well, the back door will still be open, That's but cool. but we're going to put uh, where we have the cashier now. We're going to um, extend a window there. For people, so the ADA access room that comes in that way will still come in and interact with somebody, but they won't be able to just walk through. And then another part of this is because we have to put up the walls where we are, uh, like in my office, my office door is going to have to move to where the hallway is, basically where the, the down boards pictures are. And that's been our biggest part of the remodel is where do we put you guys? You know, it's big. Yeah, that's important. Yeah. yeah. So, anyway, they're going to put us in place. place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're trying to get their lighting just right for you guys. So anyway, it's, it's a wool, um, obviously, because uh, right now we don't even really have plans drawn up. I just wanted to get from this team a budget number, so, so we have the conversation with the board. But the, the entire program is presented to the board, so you guys can see kind of in more detail what we're talking about. So we still don't know. Like, I know that we're going to move um, some staff where we have the copy room and the break room. It hasn't really been determined who that's going to be. We're really taking a look at each floor and all this space and trying to, um, you know, make the best decision long term. Yeah. What about like actual like security cameras? Or we are going to have some security <coughs> cameras. IT has those in their budget, and we're also going to have we have panic buttons uh, for the personnel. We want to make it as safe for not only the town board for night meetings, but for all the employees in there as well. If I can, Terry, I think the key is mirroring a couple things that are happening. The move of different departments and that opportunity to really evaluate how town hall is being used, and then what that assessment comes up with. For lack of better words, the quick wins. I can use that from the transportation plan. Um, take care of those with this, and then address anything else from that security. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next slide. So next thing is the fleet vehicle requisitions. <coughs> This is for all the vehicles, not only in public works, but for police, engineering, parks and rec. Um, it's all the vehicles that are owned by the town of Windsor. We have them on a replacement plan every seven to ten years, depending on the type of vehicle. And so, as you can see here, in 2020, uh, there's uh, four or five vehicles for parks, police, facilities, um, and um, there's a committee that looks at all these each year and if we can run a vehicle another year or two we will do that but this is a placement of money in there so if we absolutely need to replace them we have the money available to do so in the detail uh three pieces of equipment is on page 39 of your capital packet yeah. seven billion 
Yeah, I told you he was in here. He might just off the side of his truck. <laughs> yeah. Any questions on that? Seven more units? I'm not going to be able to speed anyway. Next slide. Once again, this is more of the fleet vehicle requisitions. Um, as you can see, there's a variety of, of different things that we're going to be buying, such as dump trailers, uh, electric pool vehicle, seven patrol units, cedar attachments, disc attachments, attachments, a light tower for, um, that can be used at night. Um, so um, a street sweeper. So we've included all these and over the last 15 or 20 years these come up and our fleet uh, replacement plan tells us they need to be replaced either because of the oil sample that was taken that says that it's on the verge of, you know, not being a, a sound vehicle anymore, or that to get the most out of selling our used vehicle at the time to where it's a win-win for the town. Can I ask about that? Sorry. Sorry, what, do you, what do you lease? What kind of equipment do you, do you lease? We lease the, the motor grader, uh, the loader, and our back hose. That's it? That's it. And that is a lease that a lot of towns have been trying to get since we've had ours, but they can't get them anymore. So it's been a win-win for us. Yeah. So uh, it's basically uh, up to them to make the first move. So these are the ones that we have in place uh, over the next four years. And um, we will work. The reason there's a difference between 50, 60, 50, 80, it depends on the width of the road and what type of crossing that we need to put in. Um, as you go north or south on 7th Street, past the roundabout, and you're heading up towards 34, um, that railroad sets down in a canyon there. So we've talked to the railroad. They need to raise that railroad up and um, get it to where they want it before we can go in and put in the new crossing improvements. So. Um, you know, it's up to them to get their work done so that we can get ours done. Any other questions on that? Water line replacements. Um, we meet with engineering each year and we decide um, which roads they're going to be doing and then we try to replace our water lines ahead of time so we don't repave the street and then have to go in and replace the water lines. So, um, this is what we have in store here. There is one change in 2020. That has been done this year, so these will be moved up in 2023 will be to be de determined, so. Any questions on us? So then the budget number is 400 instead of 600. Yeah. Here's the map of what we intend to do. It shows where the replacements will take place. Um, so that's our actual plan on the map, so you can see where they're at. <coughs> uh, the other thing is we need to upgrade our SCADA system. Our SCADA system is what determines our flows from Greeley, Northwell, Fort Collins, Loveland for our water, and then also from the Kyger Reservoir and stuff for our non potable So we need to, um, our SCADA system is about 15 years old. Uh, it doesn't meet the new requirements, so we're gonna upgrade all of that and uh, we'll have the brand new equipment and security and stuff within that system to safeguard everything. <coughs> Any questions on that? Okay, out at the treatment plant, uh, we have to do some biosolvents handling improvements. Um, so we're going to be taking care of that as part of the 2020 uh, budget. Also, sewer line rehab. When I say sewer line rehab, that's we TV the lines when we jet them. We can tell whether there's a problem. 
if we can if we know there's a problem and we TV it. And most of the time it's a result of tree roots or something getting into the sewer mains. So then we go in and in situ form those and line the insides of the pipe and then recut everything out where the sewer, sewer services go. So uh, we'll be doing some more of that. We've been doing this for probably the last 25 years. So Windsor, we're way ahead of the curve. We've stayed up with keeping our old system in good shape. So we're going to continue to do that. And uh, one of the areas is Larch Drive from Stone Mountain Drive to Hemlock Drive. So Terry, I think you've already done something to analyze it, that stretch. Yeah, we've already TV'd it. Yeah. Took a look at the line and we know that there's problems there. Yep. Um, as you can see, we have some manhole rehab as well. Um, when I say manhole rehab, you probably think, well, what do you have to do with the manholes? Well, a lot of those are the old brick manholes that go down about 10 feet. And those bricks are loose, the steps are loose, or uh, they're rusted out. So we go in and redo the whole inside of the manhole so it's safe to go in and out of. And uh, it also keeps water from penetrating into the manhole. So we're not treating water that we don't need to treat. So we do all that rehabbing ahead of time. And that way we stay up once again with keeping everything in good shape. Once again, here's the map of what we intend to rehab as far as sewer lines. And in the next slide will show manholes. As you can see each year there's a different colored manholes that we'll be doing. And you know, the old, older park town is going to be about complete at the end of this year. But we've got some other areas like Windsor West, Windsor Village that are now, you know, 25 years old. So we'll start jumping into those subdivisions and getting those uh, upgraded. And that way, as Windsor grows, we've, we've kept up with the older parts and have everything uh, up to grade. I think that's it. Any other questions? Okay, so we're almost near the end, I promise. <clears throat> but before I go too far, I want to thank everybody for coming today and, and grinding this out with us. So uh, I'll cover my stuff here. We have only two capital requests, and they're both surrounding software. We've been working on a, on a system of budgeting uh, called priority-based budgeting, which is a process that they do in Fort Collins. I'm not sure yeah. about Loveland. Gre Greeley, Greeley. Fort Collins. Yeah. And I looked at a couple uh, software packages. So I, I think we kind of settled on this one for the budgeting part of it anyway. The, uh, the second will upgrade Springbrook Suites to the cloud. Springbrook is our financial software that we currently have on uh, the servers locally here. We're gonna uh, upgrade the software to the cloud. And uh, what we, we will gain from that is online customer portal for sales tax licensing and payment. People, rather than having to do everything paper, we, they can go on the, uh, on the uh, our website and, do, and fill in their forms and actually pay their sales tax. So that, that would be uh, an advantage we get from going to the cloud. So these are, these last few side slides here, slides, slides um, this is kind of summing up what we did today. Before, before you get to this, because back on your fire slide, it, it, uh, the one I'm glad to see is performance-based budgeting, so if the department doesn't perform, they, they don't do a budget. Right. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah, Springbook, yeah. one thing, my wife and I have always scratched our heads, the only invoice we get from anybody still with paper is from the town. Yeah. And, and I think we kept saying, can you just do electronic invoicing? 
But is that is that something we can transition to with this Springbrook suite? I, I think so, yes. I think so. Can you, can you note that question so I can double check? Pleasure. <coughs> Thanks, pleasure. Uh, yeah, so uh, these last few slides here are just kind of summing up what we talked about today. These are our biggest projects here. And uh, we have, you know, we have quite a few pretty amb ambitious plan, right? And uh, it's going to be a lot of money as well. So. Michael, can we go back to that previous slide? There was something I noticed on in, uh, Terry's presentation that I wanted to ask about. Um, in the sewer plant modification in 2021 and 2022, three and a half million each year. What are, what are we doing now? So, so the board is going to have a presentation from Dennis Markham pretty quick. Um, so we, we've already talked to got um, uh, solid waste or what is it? The solid biosolids bio -solid removal project. It's yeah, it's a multi-million dollar project. And so we're going to stick a pin in that and do a, a workshop with the board so you can get an update in general about that. The other thing is we're at the capacity where we need to start running both sides of the treatment plant. Okay. We've only been running through one side. And with doing that, um, it increases what we need to do. And under our new NPDES permit that tells what everything has to be at, we need to get some of this stuff under control so we'll be able to meet those requirements. So by expanding the plant, we're just talking about using the east side of the plant instead of just the west side? Or? Well, we're, we're handling so much wastewater now um, that we can no longer handle it with just one side of the plant. Right. So we'll be using both sides and um, treating the water as best we can and do a better job of treating it since we're running both sides of the plant. Because once we reach 80% capacity, we need to start the design of a new plant. And we're, at, we're close to 60% right now. And with what's going on at Rain Dance and the possibility of handling severance sewer, um, we're going to be meeting that a little. And more. Yeah. Anymore. So the seven million over the next two to three years isn't necessarily expanding the current plan. No, it's just upgrading. Making it more efficient, right. upgrading. <coughs> upgrading the system right now that we have. So just curious, Terry, when it comes to 80, and we're at eighty percent capacity, is there room? Yes. Where we are to to expand. Yes. So we same we spot. made sure when we put the plan out there initially that we would have plenty of room to add on for two or three different add-ons. And so, yeah, we're good there. Okay, good. Okay. You just reminded me of it on that last slide, so go ahead. Uh, so this, this slide details, and I think uh, David was referencing this uh, earlier, about, you know, we have it, we've had all, all these departments do their presentation and this is what we have requested in here by part. Uh, like I said, pretty, it's a fairly aggressive plan here. We have, you can see we have, as it is now, we have 36, say 37 million in projects. We're gonna not collect as much money as that, so we're gonna go in to the fund balance a little bit. A lot of that, that bite into the fund balance is, uh, well, you can see the numbers there. Um, the projects we described, we have quite a bit of money in road projects as we described earlier today. Uh, parks projects, and uh, thank you, Chief, for only doing the 50 there. That's very correct. <laughs> that worked out pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Jane, can you, when we look at this again, can we make sure that those quick hits that are in the budget for 2020 and Scott talked about 2021. If those are in these numbers, <coughs> yes, yeah, because that that will change. This, absolutely. So the use of funds number, I assume, is the gap between revenue and outlay. Yes, for just the one. So we're using essentially existing balances. Yes. 
Yes. <laughs> when I looked at this slide, it has the total revenue of 26 million. The, your next slide, the next slide, if you total those projected revenues, at least according to my assistant, Wiz, Wiz neighbor here, who oh, apparently yeah. put it in his calculator, it's like 36 million in, in projected revenues. Yeah. Can we? So well, it's probably, it's, I, I think it's because we combined everything in that summary. I think that we're probably that the money we're taking out of reserve is because we didn't have fund. The revenue doesn't offset it. But you're right. I mean, for total funds, I think we're it balances out closer. It's just you've got. Um, Thinking like for I think a road improvement fund we're taking more out than it's coming in, so I think that's why there's that that deficit shown. I think it, if you go back one slide, I, I think combining it that way I can barely read that. is a little bit misleading. Are these are these maybe flip flops? No, they just don't tie to the next page. I uh, think it's okay. you know, We'll, we'll check on that and get back with you. I have a question on the next slide. First one, the Conservation Trust Fund. What are operating expenses out of there? Um, that seems like a big number for 1.1. <coughs> yeah, why is that operating? We do, there is some, uh, That's there is some. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. I know one of the, but it's not that large. It's like you pay the, uh, I think twenty thousand dollars to the trail manager. That's right. our portion, but it, it's not one point one. I was thinking if that's the staff salary with only one person. Right. I can see that. <coughs> and then my other question on that slide: Where are some of the other funds that were the road impact? Is that does that go into the capital improvement yes. fund? Okay. Yes. 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 We just keep track of it within the within the within capital the improvement okay. fund. Okay. What I was trying to show here is that, you know, I mentioned to Carl, we had a lot of, we had a, we've seen a lot of numbers today, a lot of big numbers. And the good news is, is I wanted to show here that, uh, you know, we start with this and, uh, co you know, we collect whatever this adds up to. We spend the money, we spend for the capital, and at the end of the year, we still have some money left. Now, that's the kind of thing, as we talked earlier today, we need to keep monitoring that, because this, as we all know, is in a period of exceptional growth here in the building. Okay. And the other fund I think this is the CRC expansion fund. Off of this one? Yeah. Yeah, it looks like. <laughs> We forgot that one. I just I just put the major the major ones in there. Thanks. So this is part of how you're going to break out and put all the funds on the sheet so we can see it and separate them out. Yeah. Um, yeah. I like this table. <coughs> table. Okay. Okay. Um, these are our uh, um, just fancier looking charts to, to say pretty much the same thing. Uh, all the funds we talked about today and the dollar amounts that we're planning to spend in them next year for capital projects. Carl. This is what we tried to show here was how this uh, capital improvement plan uh, matches up with our strategic plan. These are the larger areas, and you know you can kind of connect the dots here. The infrastructure, 20 million, quality of life, you know, on and on. Those are the goals out of our our strategic plan, and we wanted to tie the dollars that we put here today to the strategic plan. Next, I appreciate you doing that. Yeah, it's good. Thanks, Carl. <laughs> <laughs>
So th what this is here is uh, the funds that we, we addressed in our capital improvement plan. We did this for five years, 2020 to 2024. The total we had on the books for those years was that 94.2 million up in the top. And these were the, how it broke out between funds. So you can see, you know, the, ne the next five years, we have quite a few things planned. And uh, it'll, it'll be a busy few years. Next slide. Now, the bad news is we also have we also have a bunch of projects that we know we want to do, but as of now, we either have not figured a way to fund them, or they are, they are long, um, further out from five years. For instance, the regional water treatment plant, if that comes to fruition, that will be outside of five years. But these are, are projects, like I said, that we know are out there on the horizon. We just didn't include them in this five-year plan. Next slide. Now, in addition to the really big projects, we also have some smaller things uh, that we have in the, we have small equipment lines in the capital improvement plan. Um, you can see, uh, uh, Shane alluded to it uh, earlier, uh, the chief has, rifle program, gas mask, bike equipment. You know, I, I don't have to read it to you, but also the facilities. Terry talked about some of the stuff we want to do for the facilities. So those are a bunch of uh, things that we're going to do that aren't necessarily big capital projects. It's smaller equipment and stuff like that. What's the, oh, I'm sorry. Are you still in the long-term community? Can we go back? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'm still trying. I was looking through. Well, one I wanted to bring out that Shane had mentioned earlier was the um, a possible new police station or whatever. I'm going none of that's on here. That'll be part of the facility plan. We haven't even delved into that yet. Paul's not there. Great. Yeah, uh, and then Shane, what's this? Uh, the five million for town hall remodel and annex. Yeah. Great question. Um, so. We talked earlier about um, how this is the shown here. We're able to move HR and IT out here and create some room in the town hall, um, not knowing what the future is going to bring. At some point, we're going to build out again the town hall. The next logical move is to take our community development folks, planning, engineering, um, maybe economic development, and spin them off into their own facility. And you know, a lot of our municipalities, when you go to, to visit those folks in some different building, um, the concept right now is maybe we can put them where those basketball courts are, right in the main park. So we can keep the parking, kind of expand the parking there. You still can have a one stop shop, you have a municipal complex. And so that would be the idea at that point. If we're able to move, I think we could also um, put in an actual boardroom, a courtroom, I think we could address ADA accessibility, you know, things like that. So that would be all part of that annex. And then we have the ability to bring HRIC back to town hall and create some more space out there for public work. So again, it's just, I, I don't know how much it's going to cost. It's just getting down on paper, putting it down on paper. Well, it starts the discussion now. Yeah, it does. But, but that's kind of the idea. You know, we really are trying to think. Um, two or three or four steps ahead of where the community is, kind of where we're going to go in the future. I think the facility master plan will give us a lot better number, um, but I was just trying to get something down on paper right now. But I appreciate you putting that in there. Okay. Right. Any other questions? Uh, so this is, these are <laughs> items that we completed this year that we had put in the 2019 budget. The, the uh, street maintenance, and we've talked at length about the, the road work, especially the roundabouts. So those are, uh, are they done or just about done? Just about. Just about. <coughs> and uh, we oh, spoke oh, about oh. Harmony Road earlier today as well. So we'll be right about. Can I, can I see in a future slide on that? I'd like to see the road what we were presented with last year in the budget. What those project 
costs. All the comparison. And what they actually sure. ended up costing. So did we budget correctly? Did we over budget? Did we under budget? How close are we accurately are we, are we budgeting? Well, I can say we didn't get the roundabouts. Right. Right. <laughs> so, and on these, are this, is this the total cost between, or is this just the cost moving out of 20, moving into 20? On this oh, slide? So, so none of these had cost in, so if these all had cost in 2019, I'd like to see that on a future slide too. So we now perhaps see the whole spectrum of these, yeah. not just what we're rolling into 2020. But again, what we projected last year in 2019, our cost was going to be, and what we ended up now paying in 2019, and what the projected cost is going over into 2020. Okay. Would this possibly be like a special, a special meeting of like CIP follow-up, but like this, you know, where we can talk about paying? Yeah. 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 Okay, so I guess we just, by default, what, you know, additional items and things that we, we want to keep working on. So, um, once again, thank you for for everybody's hard work here and, and uh, working with us here today. Um, any questions before we go? We appreciate all your hard work. Yeah. Thanks to everybody. Yeah. Yeah. All the staff. I just need a reminder of the, the, the CRC expansion tax. How many more years do we have on that before? Is it, is it in its fourth year out of 20? Is that we, a 20 year? We started, we started collecting it in 2015. 14. Right after it 14? And so, and it goes to when? Till, is it a, was that a 20 year or a 30? As soon as it's paid off, it was a 20 to start with, but then we so can you, can, you, can you bring that back to us too so we can just see, like, I'd like to see when, how much longer we have on that or when that is going to sunset or when it's scheduled well, to sunset? Yeah, part, part of it will sunset when the bonds are paid off. Right. But part of it will keep going right. for main own them costs. Okay, but yes. But, but I think there's some thought already in the process like when that sunsets, how we might be able to recapture that dollar. I, just, I don't know. I'd like to see when that's going to happen. And how, how many more years do we have to be thinking about that? Or, or is it a long time out? Do you want to say something? No, thank you, everybody. I uh, appreciate it. Thanks, Crystal. If you have any, uh, from the board, if you guys have any other questions that occur to you,